With equipment breakdown coverage from American Family Insurance, you can protect all the things that keep your dream home running from sudden mechanical or electrical issues. Because this sound shouldn't mean... Contact your local agent or visit AmFam.com to learn more. American Family Insurance. Insure carefully. Dream fearlessly. Refer to policy for equipment breakdown covered losses, deductible limitations, and exclusions. American Family Mutual Insurance Company, S.I. and its operating company, 6000 American Parkway, Madison, Wisconsin. Products not available in every state. You didn't. Uh, yep. I thought you learned your lesson. I guess not. Dad... The vultures are back. Okay, kids, you know the drill. Windows up. Gone too far looking for a good deal on gas? Try Price Match, only from BP Me Rewards at participating BP and Amico stations. Learn more at bp.com slash best price. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. to Wrestling Omakase. It is episode number 217, and this week on the show, I'm very pleased to be joined by noted Islander, Mr. <laughs> Liam. A joke no one listens. <laughs> Literally nobody listening is going to get that joke, so we'll have to explain it. Uh, how are you doing today, Liam? Yeah, I mean, my day has literally almost just started, so, you know, get up, do whatever you got to do in the morning. Jump online and record a Marcus Eight. That's how it goes, all right? That's yeah. how... There you go. That's part of a, a well-balanced it's, breakfast. And it's winter for you. It's summer over here. Everything is Oh, it is upside freezing down. around here. I can tell you that. Like, yeah. You know um, when it gets real cold, and even though your room is still cold, your, your windows will be covered in condensation? That sounds wonderful right now. That's exactly what's okay. happening for me. <laughs> sounds sounds beautiful. I I am not, I don't know which season you prefer. Like obviously winter and summer both suck in their own ways, but I give me winter every time. You see, I'm I a I'm a noted winter baby. I was born in yeah. winter. I love the the cold. I, my my prevailing yeah. theory always was it's a lot more fun to try and keep warm than it is to try and keep cold. Exactly. That's very. That's exactly how I look at it too. Mm. I have all my fans and air conditioner off, and right now I'm suffering for <laughs> my art here because I just I hate the sound of fucking fans on podcasts. It drives me crazy. So I'm good. The Bruins scored. So this is what was, this is what was the story of the uh, why Liam's noted Islander. So he and I are like <laughs> sitting down here, uh, you know, pre podcast, and of course, regular Omakase listeners will know I made two bets uh, during for this NHL playoffs, fifty dollars each on the Florida Panthers, who lost in the first round to the Tampa Bay Lightning, and on the Boston Bruins, who are currently tied 2-2 with the Islanders, although it's not looking good, because uh, just this is game five, and like just before we went on the air, the Islanders scored again to go up 5-2 to two in the game, and I just screamed out, like, fuck these Islanders. And Liam is like, and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, Liam, you know what, uh, this, you, you don't know, you probably never seen a hockey game in your life, you know what I'm talking about. And you're just like, you know, out of context, fuck these Islanders seems kind of offensive. <laughs> like, I just didn't I, expect you know, it. I was like, this is very blatant, too. <laughs> like, and it's like, you can sound like I'm think, talking about, all, you know, all sorts of people. Yeah. I was like, no, fuck the New York Islanders, <laughs> the hockey club, not any other Islanders. <laughs> but yes, the, the Bruins just scored to make it 5-3, so maybe they have a, uh, a comeback in their bones as the 
kids say. Kids don't actually say that. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, so, so that game is going on right now as I'm recording because it is nighttime for me uh, in the northern hemisphere or whatever, the other side of the world. That, that hemisphere actually doesn't do it. What the fuck am I talking about? On the other side of the world, uh, it is, uh, you know, nighttime. <laughs> Here we are talking Aren't about Are time that. zones fun? Yeah. Uh, if, if, so you're like really, like really, really close to Japan time, right? That's yeah, um, I'm. I get really lucky when it comes to watching Japanese shows, especially like Tokyo domes and stuff. Like the dome shows normally start at like five p.m. for me, so yeah, that would I be get awesome. like the perfect array. Like the most that ever like gets late is sometimes when they have very late shows in Japan. They'll finish at like one a.m. here, but that's really the, like mm-hmm. the worst I get for that. The, so. I just realized, by the way, I haven't introduced you at all. So the one thing I wanted to mention, of course, is that you were formerly a podcaster on the Voice of the Wrestling Podcasting Network mm. on the Wednesday War Games podcast. Now, that was a podcast that reviewed AEW and NXT every week, AEW Dynamite, I should say. Uh, the podcast ended, of course, when American Wrestling finally ended. Yes. And <laughs> there was much rejoicing, especially by me. So, you know, now that American Wrestling is dead and gone, of course, Wednesday War Games could not continue. It so, was really just a, a vehicle for us to make memes for like 20 minutes, and then we had to talk <laughs> about wrestling. So, I, I listened to you guys a fair amount for somebody who never watched either program. I mean, okay. I feel like that was our demo, might... to be fair. Like, most of the people <laughs> who listened to our show were like, hey, I don't watch the shows, but I need someone to recap them for me. Dynamite, I watched like. I watched probably like, I don't know, like once every six weeks or something. Uh, or I did, of course, before American Wrestling ended. And, but NXT, mm. I mean, I have not watched a single episode of NXT in probably like five fucking years or something. Mm. Like, I, I can't remember the last time I watched a weekly NXT television program. Definitely not since they moved to USA. Uh, and, you know, even that many years on WWE Network. So, you know. I was you guys were my source. The same. Like, um, <laughs> since we stopped reviewing it, I don't think I've watched a single NXT show. Like, I watched one takeover. And then I watched the last episode of when we did the, the re- reunion, in big quotation marks, uh, yeah. final send-off. I wa- and then we didn't even end up talking about those episodes, but I watched that as well. <laughs> I'm sure you love that. You just got to, you had to watch them NXT for no reason. Yeah, it, it turned into more of a summary, like... you know? <laughs> I don't even know like what's like what happens on in, in WWE anymore. Like occasionally you'll see some tweet that's like, I don't know, uh, here's Bailey laughing on a bunch of screens and you know, and it's like, what the fuck is what is this? Like what are they doing? What are their goals? Like I have I really have no idea anymore. So it, it just like it, it's in its whole little separate universe that really has nothing to do with me, has no effect on me. Mm. It, it is quite great. It's just like, because nobody talks about it anymore, Liam. Yeah. That's the craziest part. It's like, I f- how many fucking wrestling accounts do I follow? And there is literally nobody on my fucking timeline tweeting about WWE unless it's WrestleMania. Yeah. WrestleMania and like the Royal Rumble, they'll fucking tweet about it then. Anything else, even other pay-per-views. There used to be a time when people still tweet about the pay-per-views constantly. Even that has ended. Even like, takeovers. Nobody fucking... <laughs> Yeah, nobody fucking tweets about this shit anymore. And it's like, they are the goddamn, like, worldwide wrestling leader. And as far as my the bubble is concerned, they may as well not even exist. It is amazing. It's, but, that sounds like <laughs> some brilliant odyssey of a land. And I wish I was fully entrenched in it, but I, I still... Oh, people do, do still tweet about it on your time? Uh, I mean, I because I feel like the, the news is... Side yeah, things. I was gonna say the reporters. The reporters tweet about it, yeah. but like as far as like like actual fans tweeting, no. like oh, you gotta watch this match. Nobody. It is like anonymous. Like I, I'm I'm always up to date on my WWE news, like who's getting released and you know what fucking new time slot they're doing. But like the news people, they don't even tweet like they watch it anymore. Like like I'm not sure if you told me like I don't know, Sean Ross Sapp has not watched a Raw in the past six months. That might be true. Like, he just doesn't mm. fucking tweet about anything going on on Raw anymore. It's just like, you know, here's the news, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. It's just very, it, it's very bizarre just ha- just how anonymous uh, WWE has become on my timeline. It's, I it's think wonderful. It's like 
a cons- consorted, is that the word? Effort by them to separate themselves from the wrestling world. And it's just worked over time now. Like, they clearly don't yeah. want to be associated with this. They want the talent. But they don't want any of the wrestling stink on them. So I think they've so firmly split their fandom from the, you know, the... I was going to say intelligent fan, but I really don't want to call us the intelligent fans. Um, the ones with the, the, with the greater world the purview, who, you know? Well, the ones who just like wrestling. I mean, they're yeah. fans... I'm not even trying to like you know if you're if you happen to be like one of the one people listening to this who loves modern WWE. I mean, first of all, uh, you know, good for you. I mean, I just yes, I don't say, really more power to you. Fine. I'm like I don't. It's not like I think you suck or anything. I I just don't really know what you like about it. I don't really. Yeah. Uh, there's lots of stuff in this world that I don't understand. The I'd love of. to have a conversation with you about yeah. why you like it, but like it's your purview. <laughs> yeah, but it's just like. You know, it just it just really has nothing to do with wrestling at this point. And like the the their one match across, I mean, the only WWE I've watched this year pretty much is those two nights of Mania, and like that Sasha Banks versus Bianca Belair match, like stood out to such a degree that I may have overrated it because like it was just like wow, they just did a wrestling match, yeah. <laughs> and, it was like, and a good like, what a good wrestling match, like it was yeah. just wrestling. It's like it was, it was like just a really simple wrestling storyline that was really awesome, and it was like I, this is like the last thing I expected. I'm, I'm like, where's the where's the explosions? Where's the evil doll? Mm. Where's the run-ins? Like, where's you know, the, like a guy? Like, what what happened in the the Bray Orton match? Like Alexa <laughs> on her throne, like puking blood or something? And that, that no, like... that was dope. First of all, it was a crown, and the crown was spewing like black <laughs> slime, funny. and it was awesome. Okay. okay. But yeah, that's like the kind of stuff I expect from WWE. I don't expect just like, ah, Sasha is the veteran and she is using her veteran wiles to beat down Bianca, but Bianca had to come back using her physical strength. I'm like, I don't expect that yeah. from a WWE main event. And it's just like, wow, this is just a wrestling match. And it was awesome. And also it was uh, like something <laughs> that they don't manage to encapture very much now was it all felt very genuine and it felt very real and you felt there was like a, a genuine emotional response from the crowd when Bianca won because we weren't like jaded to her entire story <laughs> at this point. Yeah. But now she's getting laughed at by a million screens of Bailey. So they pulled her right into the, <laughs> I was going to say, I didn't even know if she's like wrestled since. <laughs> yeah. They pulled her into their whole deal. I, I hadn't seen her since mainly until I saw that GIF of uh, the 500 Bailey screams laughing at Bianca, which I would love to know what the explanation is. Like, is she now spooky as well? Is I it think... spooky Bailey? Everyone just can control the production room. I see. Okay, <laughs> like, she just made a call. She's like, hey, I'm going to do this thing. Could you please put me on every screen to intimidate Bianca? <laughs> uh, yeah, we sure can. That's what we're here for. Uh, to be fair, yeah, so- you know, in, within the KV world, I'm sure the production would bend the, to the whims of the talent, you know? Yeah, it's fine. It's Bailey, damn it. But- <laughs> I guess that's fine. Uh, but yes, the point is, I don't know how we end up on this, but uh, yeah, there's a WWE. There's a WWE talk for some reason. That's what people came um, for, right? They wanted to hear about WWE talk. They, they, love, right? they love tuning in on Wakanda. I guess because you used to host Wednesday War Games, you somehow ended up on this. Yeah. Uh, so what has your life been like since you're no long, you've no longer been a weekly podcaster, Liam? Oh, you know, it's just so it's freeing, isn't better. it? You just you don't have to worry about it anymore. You don't have to get these shows in. Don't have to watch NXT. It's great. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's been, you know, it's been, it's been pretty normal. I've just been doing what I was doing before, except I didn't have to put an hour and a half away on a Thursday for me to <laughs> record. Um, on a Thursday or a Friday or a Saturday. Or <laughs> uh, you know, day. whatever it ends up being. <laughs> or um, four days later and we're both recording separate audio files. Um, yes. I don't know. We've been basically... Well, here, you know, we're back in lockdown again, which is always fun. Um, again? Really? Yeah. I totally missed that. Yeah, well, it's just Victoria, so... Um, oh. I don't know when we're... Like, it's, I think it's going to get extended again, which will be the third week of this lockdown. And it's very infuriating yeah, so, because, you know, I would very really like to get the jab. <laughs> it's very far from the American experience where, like, pretty much everybody's just decided, you know what, we all, the, the people who want jabs can get jabs. So uh, if you don't want a jab, it's up to you. Yeah. Like, you can go out there and risk your life. 
It's like, yeah, everything is open here. The, I mean, the, the masking thing is very, like, I don't know. Like, I've heard some areas of the country, nobody's wearing a mask anymore. That's definitely not the case in New York. Like, I, even though it's not, I don't think it's technically required to vaccinate people. Almost everybody here is still doing it. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, which I don't I don't mind at all. I wonder if that's one of the things but, we'll just pick up a little bit. Yeah, I think it's just kind of going to be around for a while. It's like, but, um. But, yeah, I mean, like, the, you, the, you know the biggest thing? Mm that made me realize things are really getting back to normal here is Otakon's actually going to happen. <laughs> just like the big East Coast anime comments. They were like, they put out a thing like a few weeks ago. They're like, yeah, we're actually having this convention because they're like, it's early August. Mm. So, you know, people are like, oh, is that going to be like just too early to do a convention? Like, no, nah, we're happening. I can't believe That's we're already happened. back to conventions. I know. It's kind of crazy. Like, it, it, really don't. it really struck me um, yesterday when I was watching the clip of Matt Cardona debuting in GCW. Mm. And I was like, oh, like, it's, like, firmly just back now, in it? <laughs> like, yeah, like, they got crowds making noise. It's just, like, it's very hard to go back to these uh, big Japanese shows in these gigantic buildings with just the claps now, I find. Because you're, like, yeah, you got all of this, like... And also, it because a hot Japanese crowd is so great, you know? It's like yeah. the best crowd in wrestling is a fired-up Japanese crowd. I have a harder time going back to the Japanese crowds of nowadays when I watch old Japanese stuff. Mm. I don't really have a hard time going back when I watch, like, 20 minutes of a horrible dynamite. It's like, yeah, the crowd was, the crowd was uh, cheering a lot, but I don't really care because the show sucked. Mm. I mean, why would they pair Vicky with Andrade? Hey man, what? he's got that creative control. How do you know it wasn't his choice? Vicky Andrade, it's so fucking stupid. It's like, okay, we got this uh, this this guy who could become the biggest star in the company. He's so fucking cool. Let's put him with uh, Eddie Guerrero's uh, excuse me wife. Yeah, uh, widow. Yeah, there you go. They're both Latino. I'm curious. Like, I, I think I think it's gonna be one of those like, things it, that gets dropped very quickly because they always do like God. these big things and they'll like they'll phase them out when they don't get like. A good reaction. I hope to God, because like it's it's seriously like having like Debbie said, you're having Scott Hall in '96 and being like, you know, we should pair him up with Sonny Ono. Like, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Actually, as Sonny Ono, a faithful follower of mine on Twitter, I'm gonna say that's a great idea. <laughs> I just mean like, who do we have that's like a deeply uncool manager? <laughs> Let's put them with our coolest heel we have. I don't know. Like Sonny Ono taking uh, selfies with Scott Hall as he's doing the little. <laughs> Dun, dun, it would have been, dun, dun, would have been dun, dun. really funny. That is for sure. <laughs> not, not, it's probably not as successful as the new war bond. I was going to say, that's, that's star making in my opinion. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that so going from that to uh, to these two wrestling shows is not very hard because I definitely enjoy these two shows a lot more. So let's talk about what those two shows are, mm-hmm. which were the New Japan Dominion show and the Cyber Fight Festival. All together, I mean, actually, I got to do a Patreon vote before that. But I will say, all together, um, I would say this was, like, my favorite week of wrestling in a long time. Like, my my level of interest in current wrestling, because, again, I don't care about the American shit. It's really just Japanese wrestling for me. But my interest in current wrestling had, been, had like, plummeted to, you know, never-before-seen deaths in the mm-hmm. last few months. Like, I just really had no interest at all in what was going on in, in Japanese wrestling. But, you know, last week they had those two Corrigan made events that were, like, probably the best things New Japan has done in Corrigan Hall in a million years with the uh, the tag titles and six-man titles. So that was a good little start. And then Cyber Fight Festival, for the most part, was pretty damn great, even though it had a pretty long undercard that didn't have a ton of interesting stuff. But the, the, big, ma- the big matches all delivered for me. Uh, and then Dominion you know, only a five match show and the top three matches were all good to great. And it had, you know, one of the biggest shocking finishes and quite a long time. And it's like, yeah, some excitement here again, finally, it just felt like, you know, we like, we've been such, stuck in such a fucking holding pattern and, you know, the, the COVID picture in Japan is improving a little bit, which also makes it a little better for the future. Like they, they're finally vaccinating people at least, uh, you know, they're up to almost 500,000 a day. So, you know, there's a little room for optimism there, and the shows have been uh, pretty damn good, you know, especially compared to what we've gotten, you know, for the months beforehand. So, yeah, so I think this is the, it, it's definitely uh, sort of damning it with fate praise because 2021 has <laughs> been so horrible, 
But this has been the best week uh, or week and a half, what do you want to say, for Japanese wrestling in quite some time. Well, I think you'll clearly uh, have forgotten that a week or a bit, a week and a bit ago, uh, Great had their Shinjuku face show. So I think you've got your weeks mixed up slightly. There you go. There you go. <laughs> you got me. Um, before we get into the actual shows, uh, I do want to plug the Patreon. So you may have noticed if you're on the free feed a few weeks ago, it's been a few weeks since your last free show. Uh, we're sick. We're going over to a little bit of a different schedule when it comes to the full omakases. Basically, so I first rolled out this Patreon a year ago, right? And I was doing four episodes a week, you know, the same schedule of free episodes that I was doing beforehand, plus two more full episodes. So I was doing six full episodes a month, plus, uh, you know, the all the other Patreon bonus content, and I was driving myself insane. So that probably wasn't good. Then after that, I switched to, um, you know, I, I very quietly switched to like skipping one week a month at least on the free feed. So it was three free episodes plus the two Patreon exclusive ones. That helped a little bit, but five episodes is still a lot to do in a month. So we're basically switching to an easier format, which is every other week we do a full episode. One week, just like this week, it'll be here on the free feed. The next week it'll be on the Patreon. So all this means is if you're a freeloader, like I'm sure most of you are, you get um, you know, a free omakase every other week. If you want to get, still get an omakase every week, all you have to do is sign up for the Patreon for only $5 per month, and you will go back to getting an omakase uh, every single week because we will do a Patreon-exclusive episode on the weeks where there is no free episode. Uh, we've been doing our... Plus, we get beyond the two Patreon-exclusive episodes you get per month. You also get bonus content. Uh, we've been doing the one-match series following every Naito Tanahashi match in order. Uh, chronicling each match, you know, full match reviews and recaps, along with lots of other information on, you know, both men's careers. There's a lot of fun going deep into the uh, start of LIJ for Naito recently on that series. But, you know, obviously the, the matches go all the way back to 2009. So we do all sorts of, uh, you know, historical content uh, for a very undercovered period of New Japan. Uh, we've also done like Okada, Okada Tanahashi, Naito Ishii. Uh, we've done request by patrons or patrons get to submit their own matches uh, they want me to cover which have been a lot of fun a lot of wacky stuff for that um we did all the tokyo dome main events in order through 1995 and we will resume that series at some point and so all sorts of things and that's all in the one match umbrella on top of that we also do bonus tournament coverage on the patreon and this week we'll be doing the king of ddt first round exclusively on the patreon so that'll be on thursday uh, when we cover the first round of the King of DET tournament. So that'll be a bonus episode only for patrons. So again, you can get all this content, uh, you know, like I said, an episode every week, a full episode every week, plus all our other bonus content, uh, everything that we've been recording for a year. There's a ton of stuff on there now if you've never been a subscriber. Uh, and that is at patreon.com slash wrestling omakase. Again, patreon.com slash wrestling omakase. Only $5 per month. Uh, help me out here since my Bruins bet is not looking good. <laughs> <laughs> They're still down five to three with about five and a half minutes left. So, you know, I definitely need to make some money back from my poor choices in sports gambling. So you can help me out with that one. Okay. Uh, there's your Patreon plug. Let's get into Dominion, which was uh, New Japan Dominion 6 6 in Osaka Joe Hall which, of course, took place on June 7th, which was already very <laughs> funny. But they had to, they, for some reason, based, oh, the Bruins just scored. Never mind. They made bets looking good. I don't need your $5. There we go. <laughs> they just got to score one more goal and tie this fucking game. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Liam, it must be even more awesome to follow this along when you have, like, no, like, you've never seen a hockey game, right? You have no conception about the uh, sport. Involved. Not hockey on ice, no. Do you, you guys have field hockey? Yeah, right? we, we have that? field hockey. Um, okay. We have like a, a fair... We have a bit of everything except ice or <laughs> sports. Because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it seems yeah. counterproductive to try and have <laughs> an ice rink in an uh, island, huh? That is basically just a yeah. giant desert. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. They put, the, they put fucking hockey teams in like Las Vegas and Arizona here. So. I'm sure there actually is out know. here, but... 
Yeah. I don't know. Oh, I especially coming from regional Australia, uh, we only had field hockey, which I played a little bit of. That's a very scary game. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. The Bru- well, I don't. You, this again will mean nothing to you, but the Bruins have outshot these fucking Islanders. These fucking Islanders, forty-two to nineteen, and they're somehow still losing this game. So that's uh, that's something. Well, anyway. I look forward <laughs> so, to the updates throughout. I'm I'm fully invested now. <laughs> uh. We have the IWGP World Heavyweight title. That was the main event of Dominion. Shingo Takagi defeating Kazuchika Okada in 36-06 with the last of the Dragon to become the third World Heavyweight Champion after, of course, Will Ospreay had to uh, vacate the title due for his, uh, I don't know, neck injury of... He lost his smile. Uh, unknown severity. There you go. He lost his smile. <laughs> That's an even better way to put it. Yeah. Uh, so, so, Liam, were you surprised by this Shingo Takagi victory uh shingo was my pick going in but in, <laughs> okay. in the same way was he really yeah I, I i thought shingo was winning here just because he was coming off the two losses but oh. also it's okada so you like I, I wouldn't have been surprised either way like i i had i was like oh, i think shingo's gonna win because they're doing this whole new um new it feels like there's a whole new era of branding that they're doing in New Japan, and I feel like Shingo's a very big part of that branding. So I thought him coming in, coming off the two losses to Will, it would make a lot of sense for him to be the one to to win it here. But um, again, it's Okada. If Okada wins, you're not exactly going to be shocked by it, are you? Um, no. So it, to me, it brings up a lot of interesting questions, which is so so because I, I thought when they bo- announced Okada Osprey at the Dome. Like, my first thought was Okada's losing that match. Like, Osprey's going to beat him and get his one back and retain the title and then go on to lose it to whoever he's supposed to lose it to. Mm. So, that this brings up an interesting question because a lot of people seem to think Okada was winning at the Dome. And, you know, that's why Osprey vacating it was no big deal. So, first of all, this means the big question to me is what is the plan for Osprey to win at the Dome all along and then to lose it to Shingo here at Dominion? Or... Did they completely change everything after the Osprey thing happened and just decide, you know what, let's just fucking go crazy. Let's have Shingo win. But it's really interesting. That's really un New Japan like. Yeah. It's really un New Japan like. I think, regardless, the long term plan was Shingo beating Osprey to get his big win and winning the title. But I also I was kind of under the impression that Okada would have won too. But now that you do mention that, it would make more sense if Osprey was eventually just going to go on to lose to Shingo. And then, but wait, so but I just realized Shingo getting on a shot really won't make any sense because he just lost to Osprey at Dontaku. So may, you know what? Maybe Osprey was always supposed to lose to Ibushi at Dominion, lose it back to Ibushi, and they're just using Shingo to get the belt to Ibushi. I also think they knew the reaction that a Shingo win would get. So yeah. in a company that doesn't exactly have the highest amount of goodwill at the moment, I think they were like, let's do something that's going to be completely... Uh, fan serving. It's gonna. Everyone's gonna have this positive reaction to it. There's no, there's not gonna be anyone sitting there mad that Shingo won the title. You know. Well, there's some. Well, you know, there's gonna be some Dragon Gate people. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's not what I was thinking of. There's some people who really don't like Shingo. I don't. I don't know. It's one of those weird ones to me where it's like, I don't really get the people who say like, like, okay, I understand a lot of, uh, of the more out there critiques of wrestlers to to some like the more outside the mainstream opinions. I never really got the deal with Shingo. Why people? Why some people say he's bad? Like if you read, like okay, some of the critiques with Okada make a lot of sense when you read yeah. them. Even if you personally disagree with them, a lot of the critiques with Osprey to me make a lot of sense. Even the ones I don't agree with. Mm-hmm. When I read these critiques of Shingo, it's always like he runs really fast, and that's bad for some reason. But like that kind of breaks it down. Yeah. That's, I mean, I'm I'm barely paraphrasing. I'm just like. I'm sorry, why is this bad? Like, can someone explain to me? Like, I've, I've never really, the only the only critique I've ever read of Shingo that even really makes a ton of sense to me is like, oh, he's repetitive. But that really kind of goes for like every goddamn wrestler on the face of the earth. Yeah, so, like, he, he has spots like, that he goes to over and over <laughs> again. And it's like, well, yes. Yeah, like every wrestler. Like that to me is the, the ultimate, um, I don't know, the, the, like the ultimate, like I have nothing to really critique this wrestler about, but I'm, I don't like them for some mm-hmm. reason. It's like, oh, they're, they're repetitive. I'm like, well, I hate to tell you, so is every goddamn wrestler. I don't, like, sure, some are maybe a little more than others. Like, you know, there's definitely an Ishii match, for instance. Yeah. But, like, 
it's a really it's a it's not a great critique of any wrestler that they're repetitive because like it's, so is everybody. I mean, you know, I love Hideki Suzuki, but he kind of <laughs> he kind of does a lot of the same holes in every match. I mean, mm. kind of predict that I was going to start with this the, this mat wrestling here and this. I mean, you can kind of say this for any wrestler. Is my whole point. I mean, you can ma- you can map out any like you can get two people in your head yeah. and then you can imagine the, how the match would go like because yeah. especially if you're like you've watched them the entire time that's just how it is but yeah. I yeah I don't think that's a, a particularly valid criticism of the pro wrestling business like hey this person does a lot of the same stuff once they've established oh, they their moves set. yeah they have a move set whoa unlike any other wrestler mm. but yeah I don't know the, the shingo the shingo critiques have always confuse me i have to say uh so other than those people who say running and doing moves is bad uh it's you know shingo like you said is usually pretty beloved by most people mm. and, and you can tell, can tell from the reaction too when he won yeah i mean her own war range side was going crazy mm. which was great it was great having on commentary to react to his stable mate winning people like uh, remember really was, shingo was originally oh sorry i was just oh, gonna sorry. say that um people really didn't like expect this no, in I the building. Been, fuck it. Well, well, I was people didn't expect in the building. I was spoiled on it. I have to say before I watched the match, which may have even hurt my enjoyment of the match a little bit. Now I will say, it's partially my fault for opening the voice wrestling slack at all. But usually, <laughs> it's if you were trying to avoid a a puro match result, just don't go in puro, and you'll be, and you'll be able to avoid it. Yeah. For some reason, everybody's uh-huh. like, you know, we gotta yeah put this in weekly thread. Uh, I think. Joe Gagne was complaining about being spoiled in Twitter and drama, which spoiled me. Uh, so, yes, I mean, it's like, I th- so, so at first I saw like what I would call half spoilers, where like I saw in the corner of my eye, yeah, I'm sure this happened to you. It's probably happened to everybody if, if they've been watching wrestling long enough. Like out of the corner of my eye, I saw something that's like, could have been, meant that Shingo won without literally saying Shingo won the match. I think it was like Joe Gagne expressing that, he got spoiled on something without mm. actually saying what that was, which was like, okay, well, clearly he wouldn't be mad if Okada won. So unless he's really mad that Yo won the junior title, it's probably that Shingo won. Do you ever um, lie to yourself when you get a spoiler oh, and you yeah. and you go, oh, yeah. you go, oh no, it could have been this. Like it, like, it yeah. could see, I could see a photo of Shingo holding the world title, and I could be like, oh well, it could be him holding the IWGP Junior Tag Titles. Like, <laughs> yeah. So I, I definitely, I was doing that today. I was like, well, that doesn't necessarily mean Shingo won. Maybe Yo won the junior title, and Joe Gagne was really upset about it. I don't know. Uh, but then later on, uh, Case's article went up, and I saw that. I was like, "Well, okay, well, then clearly, Shingo has what the the uh, the veneer of a uh, self delusion here has been pierced." Uh, Shingo has <laughs> he can't bury Shingo it. Has won the one time now, but yes. Uh, so I was spoiled going in. I will say, I thought this was easily the worst of the three matches, uh, and I'm not I really, saying that. I didn't like it that much. Okay. okay, I thought it was. I still thought it was pretty awesome, especially once it really got going. But yeah, of the three matches, I mean, the first two, their match in the G1 last year and the match in New Japan Cup were both so awesome. I mean, those are both four and a half star matches for me. This match, I, I thought it was really good. I went four stars flat on it. But like uh, some of the people on, like I saw giving this four and three quarters and five stars on uh, the Grapple app, they may be a little influenced by the finish, Liam. They may be uh, marking out, as yeah. the children say. I think because, there's, a, there's a certain I, amount of level that you can give that, though. It's like, if the finish was that yeah. impactful for you, I think you can give it, like, you can base a whole, not a whole rating, but you can base a fair part amount of your reaction to the match on. It's like, the finish was so good, it, it enveloped me in it. But my God problem knows is, I would never do I would never do that for anyone. <laughs> no, favorite. never, obviously. I never overrate any of my favorite wrestlers when they get a big one. But, like, I feel like this was <laughs> five minutes of five-star wrestling <laughs> encompassed by 30 minutes of whatever. Yeah, I mean, I like the rest of it a little more than that, I guess. I mean, it started slow, but, like, not in a bad way to me. Like, I liked all that stuff with Okada putting him in the big headlock and, you know, Shingo kind of shoulder-blocking his way out of it. Uh, where Shingo was, like, really... Well, they were starting to lose me when Shingo was, like, working over Okada's back in midsection for what felt like a long time. Uh, not in a particularly engaging or exciting way. Mm. And that money clip went on mm. forever. Which, goddamn, please, buddy, we get it. 
it's a it's a clever name, but please stop using the hold. Go back like, to Red Ink. Make, retire the Money Club. Uh, the big big spot that sort of I guess saved the the uh, the non final stretch portion of the match is the the main Japan on the floor, which looked mm. fucking brutal. Uh, Shingo just killed him with that thing on the floor, uh, and that led to a big double count out tease. Uh, I kind of didn't, like I, I thought he sold that really well. Yeah. I mean, Okada did the old, oh, I can get back in. No, never mind, I can't, and collapse on the floor, which is like, that spot can look awful mm. if you do it incorrectly. I've seen it look awful, and Okada pulled it off perfectly. So. And he did a little double back, one? too, which like, I always love. It's like, it's like 19, and he's facing the wrong direction. You're like, turn yeah. around. You're going to forget. <laughs> <Get in there. laughs> um, I have to give, a the, on the other hand, like a negative shout-out for Shingo's alternating forearms. Now, those can look stupid sometimes. He, this is not entirely Shingo's fault, though. Clearly, he did not want to lay into Kazuchika Okada here for whatever reason. And he was being very gentle with him and barely making contact. The director made the incorrect choice to zoom in on Okada's head during the sequence because it was like, ah, let's really get a good shot of the air in between Shingo's arms and Okada's head. <laughs> it was like, okay, not the time to zoom in, sir. Uh, so that, didn't, that looked horrible. Uh, but yes, after that, everything like the, you know, the, it's one of these things where it's like, it's really hard to, sometimes I feel like it can be really hard to rate these matches where like, you know, 30 minutes is ranges is like fine to pretty good. And the last five minutes is like you said, five stars. Cause like the last five minutes is the most important thing, right? Especially in a New and Japan is, main event, like historically, yeah. like you want that big counter sequence, those big falsies that... Those like super versions of the moves, you know, going all out, just fighting, fighting, and like, and like, no one does that amount better. But it's just sometimes the road getting there can be so long and arduous that you, it takes. It's like got this extra hill to overcome from it, and then you can also yeah. just end up basing your whole rating on that five minutes. And I always think, ah, oh, but what about like my 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 big judging factor for a new Japan main event is if I find the first 30 minutes of it really compelling. If I'm watching a big new Japan main event and I'm invested in that 30 minute, 40 minute stretch at the start, I know that I'm watching a really good new Japan main event, but if yeah, I'm just kind of my, droning off, exactly how I glazed it over. Too. I was going to say, it's exactly how I look at it too. Cause Naito, Naito Okada, like was the perfect example of that for me because it's like, Wow, it's the first thirty minutes are actually awesome. So yeah. I mean, you know, unless they really fuck up the closing stretch here, uh, this is gonna this is gonna be an awesome match. And I'll give you can give a shout out to your boy. Uh, the same thing for Tanahashi Omega mm. at the that last dome match, where it's like if the early portion is really good, then yeah, the rest of the match is gonna. I think that's although that they... one really did lose something down the stretch. One, it, that, actually, I would agree with that too. But um, <laughs> like that's why I always say that um, the Okada Omega draw is my favorite match because like it's sixty minutes, but I I can't take my eyes off the entire sixty minutes. That's like just you, a love, match. you love the Cody. You love the Cody drama. Corner. See, I I do. I lo- um <laughs> I love. I like interference when it's done correctly. Like I've never been someone who's like afraid of interference. I don't like it on like a dynamite every match, but when it's used in a way that I find compelling or interesting, I'm like full into it. Especially live. Like I remember um the one time that I remember I was really one way on it and everyone else was really another. Uh, was the Super J Cup Finals from a couple of years back with Tai Chi in the finals. And I remember, like, I was invested in that. I was like, oh, he's ruining the Super (laughs) J-Cup. I was like, come on. The dirty secret about New Japan interference is, like, the live crowds always go way more nuts after they happen. It's just that everybody's kind of forgotten now because, obviously, we've had these clap crowds for so long. But, like, I remember I was watching, uh, when I was doing that Nitro HEE series, and, you know, Naito and Ishii had that match at uh, Wrestling Duntaku 2016, where, you know, Naito was briefly world champion, or, or briefly heavyweight champion, I'm sorry. He's not, he has not held the uh, Super Sentai world title yet. Um, when, he, when he was briefly heavyweight champion uh, for the first time, they were doing these run-ins in the matches, when, you know, when LIJ ran in and Chaos ran out to, to uh, you know, fight them off, the dirty little secret of that run-in was like, the crowd was then so fucking heated for the rest of that match to another level that they like every other match in the series did not reach. And it's like, well, because run-ins do make the crowd buzz. I mean, they just do. 
I don't know. Um, I, I, I definitely not the type of person either who thinks they're automatically bad. It's just when you do them in every fucking show and every match. I think I like Japan. anything in wrestling, they can be overdone yeah. and they can be overblown and they can make a match worse if done incorrectly. But I also think there's a lot of value to an interference if it's done right and if it's done sparingly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, AEW has missed that last part, that is for sure. Mm. And New, well, New Japan, I, I want to say, like, New Japan for a while had missed that part, but, like, if you look at their main events in 2021, they really have not had that much interference. It has it's definitely toned things down that, a lot. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's like still so like prevalent in the undercut that I think yeah, it yeah, makes yeah. it. It still makes it. It's still on your like in your brain because you're still thinking about it. Because at the start of the show, you know, Evil and Dig Togo hit someone. You're like, oh, it's still here. Yeah, yeah. So, but like they've really done a good job getting out of the main events this year. Mm. But I'm sure Evil gets some title shot and Dig Togo will be there with choker and everything. But whatever. He'll be really um, into it. <laughs> what, what was I? What were we talking about? Okay, so the the last five minutes. Um, if it's if it's so good. You know that I can totally see elevating to a certain level, like. But on the other hand, like you're saying, I cannot give a match like four and a half stars or four and three quarters or five stars based on five minutes. So, you know, I went four stars flat on this. Um, the, the last five minutes again, there, there was some crazy shit in here with like uh, Okada, you know, going for that Rainmaker and Shingo spinning Okada around and hitting that crazy counter Rainmaker as soon as he's been spun around. Just perfectly timed. He fucking killed him with it. Uh, you know, they did all the Rainmaker counters you would expect and such, but they were all, like, really well-timed. Including, like, possibly the best version Okada's ever done of that stupid backslide into short arm uh, lariat. <laughs> oh, he that laid it spin. in on that one. Yeah, and usually that move looks like shit. Mm. Like, he's been doing that move since, like, uh, like early 2019, I want to say. And, like, usually that move fucking sucks. But they timed it perfectly here. And like you said, he killed him with it, too. And so. was that the one where he like he, he held the wrist right after and delivered the other short? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was that was like my favorite bit of this. But I I just thought it came off so crisp and so smooth. And then Shingo like ducked the final spin version. He took a couple of the, like he took those two short arm ones, like you said, and just killed Okada again with his own rainmaker. Uh, Shingo after the thirty five minute mark just drops Okada right on his head with a dragon suplex. And you're like, haha, dragon suplex, yeah. and then he does this brutal drive-by sliding elbow right to the fucking face. It just kills Okada. And then someone really goes... Vroom, I was going to say, is it Fast and part. Furious outside your place? <laughs> I guess so. Uh, Shingo then hits the last of the dragon, and that's the pen. I love that finish, because they did... God, can you shut the fuck up, sir, out there? I'm trying to do a podcast here. Why are they, like, racing cars out there? I <laughs> Ding, 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 <laughs> ding, 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 ding. I've never ding. seen. I've never seen the movie, so you. you the don't worry, uh, people. The everyone will be really into my Tokyo Drift reference. Okay. Um. Oh, that's what you were doing, fucking Ken Suzuki's theme song. Mm. I do know that song. There you go. Uh. Anyway, so if the room rooms will let me talk <laughs> without room rooming me, um. So Shingo, you know, hits last the dragon. Uh, gets the pen. But yeah, it's very decisive. And like they did the counters back and forth, but it didn't feel like like there's a certain type of finish in New Japan where it almost feels like, oh yeah, he got the he got the move in, he won, whatever. Like Jay White especially is almost like a specialist at those now where it almost feels like, you know, he got lucky more than anything. And I assume part of that's on purpose because, you know, he's a heel and all that. But, you know, even when he wins, you know, quote unquote cleanly, it, it still feels sort of uh like, ah, he just get the move and got, he just kind of got lucky. Shingo, it was, it did not feel like that. It felt like, well, Shingo fucked this guy up. He hit his own move on him. He hit that, the, the dragon suplex and then the, the crazy drive by elbow. And they just killed him for the pen. It just felt very decisive. Like, Shingo is the better man and he is a deserving world heavyweight champion. Uh, so that's, you know, it was a hell of a finish here. And honestly, I, I pretty much added a quarter star for the finish. So, would have been three and three quarters without it, but I decided to go four stars flat on it. And like I said, definitely the weakest of the three matches, but uh, that also says a lot about the other two matches too. The other two were just outstanding. So. It was so like decisive that it was surprising. Like he hit it and it pinned Okada, and I was like, taken aback by it because I expected like a yeah. big Okada kick out, 
you know, hitting with another pumping bomber, hitting with another one and pin him. Like, it was just because it was so non New Japan not to do, like, the big last kick out and then get put down with the next move, you know? But I, I yeah. was into it. I was just like, I think even the crowd, that's probably what shocked them too a little bit was, oh, this didn't go 40. Shingo beat him essentially, like, with just the big move and you you didn't get that final flurry of Okada coming back. It was... It was just a, an interesting structure and an interesting end to the match, which I really liked because it was a, it was a little different. I think I went like three and a half, three and three quarters. Okay. So I wasn't that. that far behind, but like it was purely like because I enjoyed that last six minute stretch or so, so much. But yeah, so there is your uh, new world heavyweight champion, Mr. Shingo Takagi. And I think what we can all agree on is obviously uh, this is another win for Tetsuya Naito. <laughs> He brought Shingo into the promotion, his buddy from the uh, 82 club, and he, you know, gave him this prominent position in yeah, but now the he's been replaced. greatest unit. He's given the prominent position in the greatest unit in New Japan <laughs> history, uh, Los Angeles Navas de Apon, which made another superstar here. Two of the last four champions have been Naito, protégés, or buddies, whatever you want to call it. So, uh, <laughs> Protégé you know, of Tetsuya Naito, Shingo Takagi. Yes, Exactly. Well, Evil definitely is a protege of Naito, but Shingo is more like Naito's buddy. So, you know, they uh, they really are like friends going back like fifteen. They they both went to like the Amaguchi jail. Not I'm not doing a bit here. Yeah, I, they, they were. I know the history. Time. Okay, that's why that's why Naito brought him in uh, in the LAJ. So, you know, another win for the king himself to see a Naito. And this is, I just think it's really Naito cool that it's a non New Japan guy. Yeah, I mean, it's not that rare, though. I know, I but, like, it's still, like, especially for someone... This is the first one where I was... Like, my whole formative years of watching this person weren't mm. in this company. Yeah, see, I saw a lot of Ibushi pre-New Japan, so... Yeah, I can see that. I can see how that must be, like, a big deal for mm. people like you. And I don't mean that dismissively. Whoa. Like, what do you mean? Just because like, I'm from an island, be- John? Yeah. Yes, these fucking islanders again. <sighs> uh, just like the islanders, it cost me the money. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yes, Liam is a. Uh, I mean, all these quote unquote children who came in, you know, uh, to New Japan later on, maybe and came through Dragon and saw the Shingo through Dragon Gate, and uh, you know, it could be like your first. <laughs> yes, sorry, I've only been watching New Japan for a decade now. <laughs> yeah, I'm such well, a baby. You can't, you can't touch- can't touch my two decades. <laughs> one day. Uh, one day. Um, this, this fucking car outside like throwing me off. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Can you still hear this engine or no? No, not, not it's now. Like kind of, okay, it's kind of just going like... Uh, you can tell it's on, but it's not doing anything. And it's just it's sitting like, idle. It's just sitting idle, and it's like, please, just shut, shut your stupid car up. Um, but yeah, Shingo a outsider champion like everyone who ever did work in the dragon system congratulate him except cool. uh even shima even shima well shima got that oh, i went to sleep yeah. before the shima took him like took him like five hours before he put out like congrats like, okay you know he did that one for he was busy doing team. great business all right <laughs> making great business decisions uh, there you go. Case did an article on it by the way on voice wrestling which you should check out it, despite the fact he took another shot at Evil versus Naito, uh, I'll still I'll still give him credit for that article. It was very good, but it's on VoiceWrestling.com. Okay, uh, that is the main event. Anything else? Oh, Abushi came out, or Shingo called out Abushi actually, mm. and Abushi came out. So we'll see when that happens. Something tells me that it'll be Summer Struggle and not Kazuna Road, but maybe <laughs> they really want to sell out one of all these Corkins. I don't know, uh, but I don't know. I think it'll probably be Summer Struggle. That's what we we'll see. Good match. Two cool people. Yeah. There you go. Two people that I think really uh, exemplify this uh, 2021 forward New Japan. Ibushi and, yeah. and Shingo. Hey, folks. It's time for another awkward interruption here on Wrestling Omakase because I forgot to read the ad live during the show. So, just got to break in here in a very unnatural way to tell you that support for Wrestling Omakase is brought to you by Manscaped, the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. They obsess over this technology. They obsess over it, folks. They 
you know, use that, that technology to provide you the best tools for your grooming experience. Manscaped is trusted by over 2 million men worldwide. 2 million! Uh, and we got right now an exclusive uh, offer just for my listeners. 20% off, free shipping with the code uh, omakase at manscaped.com. So, you know, get 20% off and free shipping, again, with the code omakase at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code omakase at manscaped.com. Again, 20% off, free shipping, manscaped.com, promo code omakase. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job at Manscaped. All right, so let's get back to the show here. And then the, uh, let's see, the semi main event was also Kota Ibushi, uh, defeating Jeff Cobb in 1454, the Kami Uh This was awesome as well. I mean, so, so okay. Most of the early portion of the match was just like a long Cobb beat down to Ibushi. It wasn't bad or anything. It did get a little dull with Ibushi, like, not even motioning like he was going to fight back, it felt like. Uh, I'm always really impressed, though, by just how agile Cobb is for a man of his size. There was, like, this one spot where he did this, like, running knee to a seated Ibushi in the corner. But, like, it was more like a diving knee. Like, he just really leaped forward. And just he just did this, covered so much ground so quickly. I'm like, you're a very large man. Like, how can you do this? <laughs> it was very uh We forget very that, like, he's also, like, a world-class athlete. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, he uh, Later on, though, showing off his power, he catches Ibushi on a dive just perfectly. Does not have any trouble catching this man in midair and holding him there. Uh, but Ibushi then, then kind of kicks his way out of Cobb's grip, gets back on the apron, hits his beautiful uh, quebrada, what Spanish is not my language, off the top rope instead of instead of the middle rope. You know, the acai moonsault, except off the top rope. Uh just like looks amazing. Just really, really, really beautiful moonsault. Uh, then he tries to give Jeff Cobb the swan dive German, but a very poor idea. So he can <laughs> barely lift Cobb off his feet, uh, let alone get him all the way up there. Uh, Cobb escaped and like deadlift Coda from inside the ring to the other corner uh, of the apron. But that turns out to just let Ibushi do a springboard up to the top rope where Cobb is and do a like beautiful Rana for a great near fall. Uh, Cobb then just, like, fucking later on, he has a Bushi up in a fireman's carry position and just sends him absolutely flying, uh, doing, like, a million re- uh, revolutions all around a circle. Really, really cool. He then went for a, like, ripcord tour of the islands, just, you know, pulling him into pulling the guy into it instead of sending him into ropes, which he seems to do that as his set up more and more nowadays. Uh, but a Bushi lands on his feet, it's a high kick, followed by the Kamigoe. I figured that was a finish, but no, Cobb kicks out at two. So that was a big moment for him there. Gets an audibly surprised reaction from the crowd. Uh, Koda goes for another Kamigoe. Cobb sidesteps and goes for the Kabi- Kabgoe, I guess. Is it Kabogoe? I don't know. Kabogoe. Either- <laughs> Kabogoe, I don't know. Uh, Koda counters by leaping into his arms, but Cobb throws him back down on the mat and finally hits a gigantic Kabogoe. Uh, that looked awesome. But it left both guys down for a while. Cobb wasn't able to cover. And he finally crawls over. Ibushi kicks out. And I thought it was kind of funny. They protected, they protected Cobb's ripoff, the Cobb Goe, more than they protected the actual Cobb Goe. I think he's going to keep using it going forward. I think yeah. that's going to be a part of Cobb's moveset. Uh, he tries to pull Koda straight into the islands again, this time from laying on the mat, which was even more impressive. But Ibushi countered right from the inside cradle, which I thought could have been the finish for a second. That was an awesome near fall. Uh, but less awesome is the spot right after, which was, <laughs> what was going on here, Liam? Koda, like, leaped up onto him, and they just kind of fell down. And, like, Cobb puts him back up there, and they fall down again. And Koda just hits the comic going and gets the pen. Uh, do you even understand what they were trying to for? Because I really didn't get it. I yeah, I I didn't really. I watched. I I kept rewatching this, and I was like, I don't even Me know too. what was the plan here. Was yeah. it meant to be like some like weird jumping off of you into a Kamagoe kind of like was was kind of uh, trying to do maybe. some video game stuff right there? Like yeah, that could be it. But I think Cobb may have fucked up his shoulder. Unfortunately, that seemed like it may have happened. 
So I guess we'll have to keep uh, our eyes on it. God knows United Empire needs another person missing. Uh, it'll be, the entire empire will be, will be the great Okan. Uh, the not-so-United Empire. empire. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, ha, ha, ha. But yes, uh, it would have been four and a quarter for me and match of the night without the botch, but that botch was so gigantic, I had to bring it down to four stars. So still a great match, still a match I highly recommend watching, but, you know, the finish takes it down a notch. This uh, just really reminded me of, like, one of those sleeper hits on a G1 show that's, like, third from the top, and you'll be mm. like, you'll be like, oh, that match was great. I should think about that uh, and what rewatch it at some point, and then you just never do. It's like... um. Yeah. Like Ibushi and Taichi from last G1, where I'm just like, oh, I should go back and rewatch that match. And I just I never remember to. <laughs> but, um, you know, yeah. sub 15 minute New Japan matches are always fun with top guys in them. And Cobb looks the most complete as a pro wrestler as I've ever seen him. Because I've never been a big Cobb fan, really. Uh, yeah. But this stuff that he's been doing lately, he, he, he feels like he's really put it all together. Yeah, it's, it's true. Um, so that, I mean, that was a, you know, it, w- it was a really, really good, like, I mean, to me, like, Cobb has clearly been putting it all together, I guess, but this is was still a good, like, you know, a good way to, I guess, put a stamp on it. Mm. I don't want to go with this. The shingle match is better, is I guess where I'm going with this. Oh, uh, the this Wrestle Kingdom match? Yeah. yeah. That match was, that, that, I think that was my favorite match of the, of the two nights. Yeah, it's, it's not far from me. It's right behind Naito Ibushi, probably. Uh, so, <clears throat> let's get to the third from the top here, which was the IWGP Junior Heavyweight title. Uh, El Desperado defeating Yo in 2340 with the Pinche logo to retain his Junior Heavyweight title. Um, you know, this was a good match. It wasn't great. Uh, they, they, did, they basically did what boiled down to dueling legwork most of the way. So, you know, your mileage may vary here. I was pretty into it. I thought both guys did a good job selling, uh, a great job selling, but especially Desperado. He's one of the only wrestlers on earth who can really do the whole scream selling thing very effectively. Uh, perhaps just simply because his screaming actually sounds like convincing instead of really, really hokey. Well, so he's really likable. Like, that's true too. I think. You watch Despy and you're like, oh, this guy's cool. I want to root for him. Especially, like, is if you're, like, one of the, the New Japan babies like me. Uh, Despy, or like, coming back, was, was, like, one of the the first, like, big return from excursions that I ever saw. And I was, so I was like, I'm a Despy guy from the beginning. So anything that that guy comes in for, I'm always going to be buying into it. And I think that really helps. It's like just he's he's so insanely likable. I don't know what it is. Is it just because he's cool? Is it just that he has a cool aesthetic and he has a cool attitude? Yeah, he plays a lot of Monster on a Rise, which I've been playing a That's lot dope. of lately too. Yeah, uh, he's a he seems like a cool dude. Uh, but yeah, the you know the the, the other big issue of the match or the first big issue I didn't name any issues. Uh, the leg work leading up to lots of dives was a little weird. It's like. Okay, you do all this leg work, then you just start doing dives that use your legs? I don't, I don't really get it. Mm. Like, Yo at least was selling it when he hit the floor the first time, but then he's like, okay, let me do two more dives without selling my leg at all. And I was like, well, what the fuck is the point on that leg work thing, guys? I don't really, don't really get it. I mean, the dives look nice, but just, it was really bizarre. Um, Especially when there was stuff that you could have done to express the leg work while doing them. Yeah. It's just one of those things where it's uh, like, they just don't think about it, I assume. It's just like, all right, this is the part now where I've got to get my cool dives in. Yeah, something like that. Uh, Desperado ends up shrugging off a super kick from Yo back in the ring. He hits a single right hand, as soon as he puts him out, and then he hits a pinche loco and does El Fantasma's wacky cross arm pin for some reason, <laughs> uh, and that gets him the win. Uh, I, you know, good match, but not much more than that for me. The, the leg work didn't go anywhere. In fact, I acted with blown off for the most part with the, all the dives afterwards. And then it just kind of ended abruptly. Uh, although I guess I like the definitive nation, nature of the finish because Yo, Yo feels he needs to do a turn or something because he definitely seems a little stuck in the mud since, since his return. Just not much going on for him. Uh, I went three and a half stars. Good match. Not great. Yeah, about the same. Uh, a really cool mid-card match that dragged on a lot for me. Yeah. I like this is one of those matches where I could I just as I pulled up the the cage match for it, I was like, 
oh, wow, this was only 23 minutes because it felt longer. Yeah. Like, this one was, like, even more than the main, this one really dragged for me. But the when the work was good, it was good. Afterward, Phantasma and Ishimori come, come out to announce that uh, the two of them are challenging Sho and Yo for the junior tag titles. On Bullet the Club's Zero cutest Bowl. tag team. <laughs> that was kind of funny. But when he, he, he basically starts to challenge Desperado for the junior title too, but Ishimori rips the mic out of his hand and challenges instead, which is, first of all, that's a badass move. <laughs> Second of all, Phantasmo did not seem very upset about it, which is confusing. It's like, you're, you're out here to challenge the junior title, and your partner rips your mic out of your hands and does it first. Shouldn't you be a little more upset? Like, I don't, I don't really understand. Nah, but, uh, he's just he's, uh, happy for his boy. <laughs> okay. It was a very, very bizarre little, uh, little, se- little end of the segment there. To be fair, it made Ishimori uh, look cool. Yeah, because, I mean, Ishimori. Um, that's probably, probably be good. Well, yeah, because I, Ishimori has like always been such a weird addition to New Japan, where it, it feels like he he's never really reached any of the heights that he could have. Mm-hmm. I mean, like you know, he's gotten the big matches, but like, did you ever really think of Ishimori as the stalwart of this division? You know, it no. felt it was like as Horimu. And then it was like, because he came in just at the tail end of the Kushida stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, so it's just, I always felt like he was never really a major part of it. So I'm hoping that with this, you know, we don't have Hiromu around at the moment. Ishimori can actually finally. Well, he, was, he, he was around. Well, yes, <laughs> he was, he was certainly <laughs> around. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, yeah, Ishimori, um, I assume he's going to lose and then Phantasma will, will do the challenge for real. Uh, maybe he'll fucking win, which, boy, do I not want to see. But uh, I know some people love Phantasma, so. Some uh, people. Y'all are weird. Y'all are weird. Uh, match number two was a six-man tag team bout. The LIJ team of Naito, Sonata, and Bushi defeating the suzuki Goon trio of Taichi, Zack, and Dogi. Sonata pinning Zack in 1131 with what they're calling the Aussie Suplex. Okay. Don't know what that has to do with Australia or suplexes, frankly. Um, so Hiromu, who I mentioned, was on, he came out the start of the show. He was on commentary here. He was like rocking out to Naito's theme song when they showed him ring sideways. That was adorable. But then Naito, while this man is like just having a good old time rocking out to the theme song, he comes down the ramp and he demands that Hiromu come over and hold the ropes open for him, which is Funny enough already, the Hiromu fight, gets off the commentary. For some reason, he has to hold the two cats with him when he walks all the way over there. I'm just like, why not just leave the cats at, at the commentary table, sir? But he walks all the way over there. He holds the ropes open finally. And Nigel gets up there and shakes the ropes up and down as much as possible. And I'm like, what are you two? Like, these two just love to do nothing but fuck with each other. It is like the funniest shit. And the, the entire post-match, when like Taichi and Zach are trying to point at Naito and Sonata is like, oh yeah, we're setting up a tag title match. Naito doesn't give a fuck. All he's doing is like pointing at her role more ringside and trying to get him to do something and like react with her. It's like all Naito cares about is Hiromu Takahashi. He, everything else on the, on the earth could, could not exist for all he gives a shit about. Like that's all he cares about is this, this uh, weird cat man. But there you go. What I enjoy uh, about them though is everything they do comes across as very genuine. Like, you don't think oh, it's yeah. a bit, you think it's just two friends fucking with each other? Yeah. I mean, you can tell. They just, do. they enjoy each other's company. Uh, Bushi's normal mask, by the way, now have no mask, no mouth hole. I don't know if you noticed, this. that started a few weeks ago. It's like, you know what? Given Japan's COVID situation, probably a smart idea, honestly. <laughs> Given all the all the people in Japan that got, uh, that got COVID, he was like, hey, mask man, how about you don't give me a mouth hole yeah. <laughs> for a while? That's it. That's it. Like, right. <laughs> it's like a good idea by Bougie. Well, so I love the full mask look, like with the the mouth covered. It must be the worst to wrestle in, but yeah, it, it looks so cool. The makeup, the refs, and the announcers, like you know, have the the full the, the face mask on now, and uh, not the wrestlers because I guess it is pretty difficult. But Bushi's like, you know what? I'm going to do it. Mm. Maybe he's just doing it out of solidarity. I don't know. Solidarity with Red Shoes. Maybe he's doing it out of uh, solidarity with Tai Chi. There you go. Naito, well, what are you talking about? What does Tai Chi have? Tai Chi doesn't have a mask on when he wrestles. I, I meant like because he had COVID. 
I see. Okay. Uh, it's NATO the subtext decides... of the feud, John. There you go. You have to dig deep. NATO, de- <laughs> NATO decides to do a late takedown to poor referee Sato when Taiji will look, lock up at him first. That was pretty fucking funny. Uh, I, I think Taiji even asked the ref who wanted to give up, which was also pretty funny. So, you know, lots of little jokes here. We had like, a good time. Uh, they, they even made it like the wild brawl around ringside, but it ended with a really fun Sonata Zach reversal sequence. They traded flash pin attempts before or back and forth before Sonata got an innovative or invent, inventive counter, whatever you want to call it, something with an eye uh, of Zach's signature cradle. He basically like stopped him in midair as Zach was coming down and then gr- grabbed, like hooked his arms like he's going for a tiger suplex and then just like backslid him from using that that grip, and that was the pin. So that was really cool. I thought that was a really, really cool finish. Um, you know, I, I, I had a quarter star just for a, a finish that was that good. So I gave it three and a quarter. I thought it was a pretty fun match. Definitely a six-man tag I had a good time with. And obviously, Sonata pinning Jack basically confirms that we'll be getting a uh, IWGP tag team title match between these two teams, which is A-OK by me. Triple six was robbed. Triple six was robbed. There you go. What do you think of the match, Liam? Um, I mean, it was... I, I thought it was a more interesting than average undercard six man. Um, uh, my, I'll use this as a, a transition to talk about a point that I forgot to bring up in the junior title match. But these um, Suzuki Goon uh, being like these weird bad guys who get face reactions um, is such an interesting point for me. Uh, and it was really came to a head in the Desperado match where. <laughs> He pulled a chair out and smashed it across Yo's leg to polite applause. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're 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 basically where Lij was in like 2015, 2016. But like, like this... they, they're... sorry, oh, sorry go, ahead. go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say they're they're like heels who uh, the crowd likes anyway. Yeah, and and they kind of position them anyway. Like like when they go up against, you know, the true neutral, and they go up against like the real heels, like Bullet Club and. United Empire and, you know, whatever they, they, they you know, they, the fans do, I mean, the fans cheer them, but they're also, or clap for them, I want to say. But, I mean, the, the fans, they, they're positioned as the baby faces in those feuds. Mm. I mean, they clearly were in the G.O.D. feud. But now they're up against L.I.J., they're going to be the, you know, they're the heels again, so. But, like, especially after that, like, big emotional promo from Tai Chi after winning the belts, I was like, I'm so, I, yeah. I love them. <laughs> they're my little degenerates. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm I'm really excited to see just like two four of my favorite guys, well three of my favorite guys in Sonata. Uh, I like Sonata, but I wouldn't call him one of my favorites. Uh, but yes, three of my favorite guys and a guy I like, let's say, uh, <laughs> you know, in a in a feud for the IWGP Tag Team Titles. So I'm excited for that. It should be fun. That being said, I will be very disappointed if Tech has immediately dropped the belts. I don't think well. Uh, I guess we'll see. Uh, the opener. Here's the thing that was not fun. It was the team of Evil, Yujiro, Chase, Ishimori, and Phantasmo beating Tanahashi, Goto, Ishii, Yoshihashi, and Sho. Uh, Taiji pinning Sho in 11.50 at the Bloody Cross. Liam, you're obviously striking me as a type who, at one point, you would have considered yourself a big Bullet Club fan, obviously. Mm-hmm. What Are you still a fan of the Bullet Club? No. Okay. <laughs> Last night, who the fuck? I tweeted. Who on earth could possibly like this this incarnation of the Bullet Club? Yeah. Who could be into and be like, that's my unit? Like, because I, I made the tweet last night. I was like, is the Bullet Club gonna last forever? And yeah. And someone responded with, um, as long as those merch sales are going, baby. And I was like, who's buying this iteration of the Bullet Club's merch? <laughs> who's like, oh, who I need that like- Yujiro Bullet Club shirt. <laughs> I really need Evil's Bullet Club shirt. I really need okay. Dick Togo's the Evil Bullet shirt, Club shirt. The Evil shirt's apparently sold in America and Japan, which is like, one, hearing that was just like, who is who are these people? Yeah, I, like, I, I need even to meet hate, them. They're like the WWE fans. I need to meet them and have a discussion. <laughs> I didn't even hate the initial turn as much as some people did, but like, I would never go out and buy a fucking Darkness Club shirt. Like, who are these people who are like, Darkness Club, here yeah. I go. Like, it's really, really bizarre. Like there's there's definitely uh, yeah, like some like people him. that I think uh, are a good like example of Bullet Club stuff, but it's just such a weird 
a weird group now. It just doesn't fit. <laughs> I mean, there's just a bunch of guys who do stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's no there's connective no, they're, tissue they're, to any of them anymore. They're heels and they do stuff. I think I mean, it would help like... if they had a different name. Yeah. And um, they were their own like, just... thing and not war- like piggybacking off like an almost decade long legacy at this point. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, like, obviously Chaos has been around even longer. Suzuki has been around even longer. But, and people do bring that up from time to time. But it's like, okay, Chaos barely exists. They're basically just a alternate Hantai at this point. Although I did find it funny, they came out to their own, they came out to Goto's theme song, and then Tanahashi came out separately. It's like, oh, they're trying to remind us that uh, Chaos and Hantai are technically separate, because a uh, few years for that now, guys. But at least with um, Chaos, it felt like there was Nakamura's group, and then there was Okada's version, you know? Like, yeah. this was they, Nakamura's and like guys, and then this was Okada's hodgepodge group. <laughs> they feel at least, like, actually friendly, and they feel like they, uh, you know, they actually are doing something, you know? Like, they don't... I don't know, like, you can imagine the Chaos people hanging out together. What do, like, Chase Owens and Taiji Shimori talk about? Texas. You know? It just doesn't really, <laughs> it doesn't really make any sense. And, like, you know, the Chaos guys, you can imagine hanging out. Obviously, Suzuki Goon, you can definitely imagine hanging out. They look like, they look like the uh, the best bunch of chums that are ever chummed. Mm. Uh, it look like they have L-I-J. some great times from, like, Instagram yeah. photos that you, you see. Yeah. I mean, though, these units look like units. Bullet Club are like, here's every scummy heel we have in the company in one unit, and, you know, they're all going to cheat, and they're called Bullet Club, and here you go. You're just like, this is the worst unit in wrestling. I fucking cannot stand them. I just, I just, and it's not like I ever come across some guy who's like, no, 2021 Bullet Club is great, and here's why. No one ever says that. So I'm like, who are these people out there still buying the fucking shirts? I really want to know. Is it just like residual sales from the original shirts? <laughs> I don't know. It's a great question. It's like, oh, they were cool like six years ago. Although I never, I mean, I never liked them. I mean, uh, you know, when I first got into it, like New Japan was basically, you know, the dev at turn. So. Yeah. I was obviously really into it then, and then, you know, Kenny is my life, so obviously I was really into <laughs> his run with it, but, like, now it just, it feels like it has no purpose. Like, even the Kenny stuff, it still felt like it had an identity. Now it's just, like, what is this group? <laughs> yeah. They're, they're a group of guys. Uh, so, anyway. <laughs> Do they Togo... even like guns? <laughs> Does anyone there even um... like a gun? <laughs> Uh, Dick Togo used the spoilers choke on Ishii to take him out because we need a, really need a run in here on this opening 10 man tag. And heat. the show was need that heat. for the bloody cross from Ishimori for the pen was a match that happened. I get two and three quarters. All right. It was all right. It wasn't even really fine. Can we talk about the A show now? <laughs> well, yeah, we can get to that. Never well, exactly. well, we do have to mention oh. Evil and Yujiro. Grab two of the never belts. Do we have to mention this? In the face with one of them. So I guess we have a never six man tag team title oh. match soon. Really keeping his aim high after that King of Pro Wrestling challenge. Uh, that's what Evil's doing. And, you know, it's Evil, Chase, maybe Yujiro. I don't know. Maybe maybe not Chase because. Well, Evil and Yujiro seem obvious. Maybe not Chase is the third guy because Chase seemed to say afterwards he was going home. So I don't know who the third guy will be. I hope it's the but spoiler. They're, they're gonna, they're going to be challenging Goto, Ishii, and Yoshihashi. And boy, it'll be a challenge for them to keep their run of uh, great never six-man title matches going. So that's going to be a real challenge. <laughs> uh, Hiromu came out to open up the show, Open up the show, by the way. Oh, yeah. So with both cats under his arms. Quite exciting. Um, but yeah, this was a, uh, you know, I thought this was a, a good show. I don't know if you can go as far as to say, like, great show, because I didn't go over four stars or anything, and... It's only a five match show, but obviously the fact that they really like booked a, a ballsy finish, they didn't just go back to Okada. It wasn't LOL Okada win, um, and it never made any sense to me why you would do a like go to all the trouble of having a new title, a new world title, and just have Okada win it on his first fucking try, just like he did with the heavyweight title. It's like that's such a boring story. I'm just so glad they did not go in that direction. So, you know. Good on New Japan. They did. They did a. They did a good booking thing. 
which is very rare for them in 2020. New Japan is alive, baby. We're back. <laughs> there you go. Only got 5,000 shows on the Kazuna Road Tour. Yeah. You don't watch all 5,000 of them, sir? I mean, <laughs> the first, like, New Japan Road Show that I watched in, like, six months was the the one with Dangerous Takers winning the tag belt, so... Yeah. I mean, no. I mean, Kazuna Road, uh, you do get a week off, and then Kazuna Road, there's no, nothing announced yet, obviously, but it's Monday, June 14th. Uh, it's three straight days of Corkin, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, then a bunch of shows that probably won't make air. Then the following week has Corkin's again on Tuesday and Wednesday. Then Sendai Sun Plaza Hall, that often does make tape. That's on Saturday, June 26th. Uh, then... Two more Corkins to wrap up the tour, uh, Thursday and Friday, July 1st and 2nd. So I believe there are, let's see, seven Corkins total on this tour. So, yeah, get into it, as uh, Joe Lando would say. I'm into uh, it. <laughs> major seven shows. Yeah, and then there's another eight-day break, and then Summer Struggle kicks off. Uh, and there's a you know two nights at Indian you know, Arena Osaka, where there'll probably be big shows there. And the, also uh, in the Goya at Dolphins Arena. So... And then there's four more Corrigans to wrap up the month of July. So lots of Corrigans. Okay. Uh, let's get to, as you called it, the main event, the Cyber Fight Festival. Uh, this was from June 6th, so yesterday, at the Saitama Super Arena. The big DDT, Noah, Tokyo Joshi, and Gumbari. Can't forget Gumbari. Mm-hmm. Uh, interpromotional show. Uh they, they, they claimed 4,800 fans, and they say that was super no vacancy. So, you know, fans certainly turned out for it during this uh, uncertain COVID time, I guess. So you got you have to call that a success. And the main event here, well, they, they build as a triple main event. Uh, but the ultimate main event, the last match here, was now Michi Marafuji defeating Keiji Muto with the Tiger King Zero in 23-30. Muto falls in his third defense, and Marafuji becomes the 36th GHC heavyweight champion. Uh, I will say the, the reaction to this has been very negative. Uh, obviously, I think most people were expecting Kaito to get the win back over Muto, and uh, that did not happen. They went with Marafuji, who is uh, not Muto old, but he is quite old and often seems quite unmotivated. So it's a little, you know, a bizarre choice to make the new GHC heavyweight champion be the one to beat Muto, I think. Uh, the most generous thing you can say. Someone who's um, like, who, well, it was like, ah, I don't know if I re- really want to be at the top of the card anymore. <laughs> don't know if I really want to be this top guy carrying the brand anymore. It's like, ah, this is the guy who beats Muto. But to be fair, Marafuji could be in a completely different, like, mental state than he was a few years ago. You know what I mean? He definitely feels like he's working at a higher level. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, he, he, he normally seems like he doesn't really want this title. Mm. So that's probably going to get surprised people. But it'll, maybe it'll be a short term right now. I don't know. But just, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think people thought the Mudo thing was leading to him putting over Kia Mia or some other young guy. Fools. And now he put over that whippersnapper, now Michi Marafuji. But, like, uh, I, I wasn't actually very down on this swap either. Like, we had the Mudo thing for a bit, but I was ready for it to be done. In some way, I would have preferred it like went to someone younger, obviously. But um, you know, I, I like I like my Marafuji. Yeah. Uh, everybody say hello to Nicole, bringing me vitamin water. Thank you, Nicole. Just give us a thumbs up because uh, I'm dying in here with no air conditioning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she did not want to actually say anything to the listeners, but uh, she did give a very thumbs up. in and out there very quickly. Oh. Really hits the spot. The triple X vitamin water. They have that in Australia, Liam. Triple X vitamin water. Uh, yes. N- not to my knowledge. <laughs> okay, you should try it. Come to America and try it sometime. It's very good. When I go to America, uh, I just want to go through all the cereal. You guys are crazy with that stuff. We have like four really? cereals. Really? <laughs> I have no idea. That's that's crazy. Yeah, we like we uh, have nothing that's like a brand. Really, it's like all generic kind of stuff. Yeah, I had no idea that, like, uh, different cereal was a big American thing. But you guys, like, uh, you can't do chocolate. That's one thing I will say. You guys don't know how chocolate works. Liam, you could tell me, you could tell me America is bad at, like, literally anything, and I would believe you. So, just how I am. 
Uh, you guys, you you guys can't can. do this wrestling thing. <laughs> that is undoubtedly true. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, so the match itself, though. There was a graphic uh, during the pre-match video informing us of this match is Genius versus Genius, mm -hmm. which is one of the times I was very happy to be able to read at least a little bit of kanji. But it's not a rematch of Mudo versus Naito from Wrestle Kingdom 8. It is Mudo versus Marafuji. Uh, you know, Tensai versus Tensai. Yeah. I, you know that's what that's genius in Japanese, Tensai? That, that's what Vince was calling him, I guess, Lord Genius? I didn't know that. <laughs> I did know that there was, like, the whole genius uh, staple is, like, an actual thing that, like, five people get called in in uh, Puro, right? It's, like, yeah. Muto, Marafuji is one, and then Naito is one, and then Tanahashi is one? Yeah, I guess. Or, like, yeah. I, I remember because it was from, like, an Ibushi interview that I think I heard it for the first time, like, with actual names associated to it. Yeah. I, I just think it's a really interesting little uh, note that can go yeah. unnoticed if, like, you don't, you know, read <laughs> random 2014 <laughs> New Japan interviews. Yeah. Uh, so they did a lot of totally fine Matt wrestling to start. Nothing that will knock your socks off or anything. But uh, Muto then did about a million dragon screws, including a really cool one off the top rope after Muto crotched Marafuji there. The actual crotching was not good. It was like Muto kind of, instead of throwing himself on the ropes to crotch him, he kind of stumbled backwards like he was drunk. And, then Mar and they didn't make nearly enough of like a effect on the ropes, so Marafuji had, kind of had to like leap himself. and It was, it was very awkward. But the dragon screw itself looked cool. Um... Marafuji, you know, he just did a really good job selling his leg before he finally came back with a couple super kicks. And he had a perfectly timed counter knee, uh, the Balion Aki uh, on the English commentary sure loved. I have to say, the English commentary on the show was awesome. I mean, they had the normal two guys, uh, Mark Pickering and uh, the other guy whose name I should know. So I'm gonna, I want to give him credit. Sterling something, I think, is the other guy. And Liam is not jumping in to save me. I don't. Hey, man, one not. of them blocked me. I, I don't know any of this. <laughs> Wait, did one of them really block you? Yeah. Who, who blocked you? Mark uh, Pickering? I think Pickering did. Oh, wow. Who I actually think I was a big fan of on this show, because I, I watched this show twice. Yeah. Um, Once English and once in Japanese, and... uh. I was like, I was actually, I was like, oh, I'm kind of sad that he blocked me now because I thought he was really good on this uh, show. He he follows me, so I don't know what what his, what, uh, what you did to him, Liam. But. Yeah, I assume I was bad mouthing Noah. Oh, okay. Because I I'm so. I'm very <laughs> open about my criticisms of the company. Uh, so Mark Pickering was on was obviously the color commentator guy, and the the play by play guy was Stuart Fulton. Yeah, there you go. I give him his proper credit, and. Unfortunately, I do not know who the Japanese man was. They said it. I really don't know. Um, he, I believe they said he was a journalist, but I, I didn't catch his name at all. So I kind of yeah, loved very his sorry that guy. Like, I thought he was. Yeah, I thought it was really good because he, he'd be like, like that'd be like it'd be like a lull, and he'd be like, "That was intense," and I'm like, "Yes, it was intense." <laughs> There's one one moment when the English commentary on this show uh, did this perfectly timed moment, which I'll, we'll talk about when we get to it, but was one of my favorite commentary bits in quite a long time. I tweeted about it a few days ago. But yes, Balian Aki, I had no idea he was going to show up here uh, as, a as a color commentator. He was great, I thought. Just really added a lot all night. And, you know, he uh, you know he loved this counter. He was really going over the top for this uh, perfectly timed counter knee that Muto threw. It looked very good. And it set up a big Shining Wizard combo for Muto. You know, he had three straight Shining Wizards. The second one from behind, which I thought was going to be the pen, but Mayor Fuji kicked out at 2.99, and that was just a really 20 minute call. Uh, Muto allegedly did an Emerald Flosion to Mayor mm. Fuji. Would have been a cool spot, but actually hit. Instead, it was more like Muto lifts Mayor Fuji over his shoulder and immediately almost drops him. But, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, despite barely hitting the backbreaker to set it up, where he, like, almost fell down again during the backbreaker, Muto actually pulled off the fucking moonsault. Mm. Pretty much perfectly. I was That worried. was amazing. I was scared. That was actually, Oh, yeah, I was too. But I was like, I, well, okay, I will say, since I was watching this late, um, you know, after the fact, I wasn't spoiled, but I figured if Muto died, I would have heard about it. <laughs> so, you know, it was like, I wasn't that worried, 
But yeah. I'm um, pretty offended that he brought it back after retiring it in Wrestle 1, but hey, you know, dance on the grave, do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, but yeah, perfect moonsault. That probably should have been the finish and presumably would have they actually was going to win. There's an insane spot, but Marafuji kicked out. I love Marafuji's comments Marifuji- after the match where he's just kind of like, huh, yeah, survived the moonsault, huh? <laughs> Even he you was know, like Marifuji- surprised by it. <laughs> Once he did, like, I was like, okay, well, he's winning now. Because I'm like, what would be the point of doing a moonsault and having that not be the finish unless Mary Rudy was winning? And indeed, he hits a couple super kicks, his step up knee, the Tiger King zero. Uh, doesn't look like much of anything here. But uh, probably because Mary Rudy doesn't want to actually kill the poor old man. Boo. But that gets extremely flat pinned to win the match and the title. Uh, I don't know, I just thought it was a very flat ending. But I thought the match was good. I didn't think, like, some of the, some of the shit I saw from it was so over the top. Uh, people get, I don't know, people got, like, really aggressive about hating this Mudo title reign, and just, like, some of it felt very performative. I like, don't get it. Okay, like, yeah. why can't yeah. we just be, like, I I get if you like it. If you like it, that's fine. Like, I think Mudo's pretty cool. I've, n- I've never been a big Mudo hater, but you have to understand where people are coming from when they say that they are <laughs> disappointed by this. <laughs> Yeah, I like guess. you don't have to agree, but surely you can understand that. Like, hey, you know, we would have preferred a, a targeted youth movement in this company over going to Mudo. Well, I meant aggressive in the other direction too, where it's like the people who really hate it, like, have to tell you constantly mm. how much they hate it and how much they hate all the matches. Where I don't think the matches have been that bad. I think the Cardo uh, matches was legitimately a match of the year candidate, the first one. Which one? Oh, but, yeah. And then I think I really, I really, I really enjoyed, like the, I enjoyed the, the Go one. I, I really like the what's it called the uh, oh was that I'm sorry was that what you said the Kidomiya? Yeah, I said the, the I said the Kiyomiya one, um, the first uh, one no, the before Kid- he won the title. Master Kidomiya, Master Kidomiya. Yeah. I love that match. I haven't seen that one yet. So, okay, so that match is awesome, um, and I like the Go match a lot too. I thought that was pretty awesome, but uh, you know there was one in between that wasn't that. What was it? What was the one that wasn't that good? Can't remember which one it was now. Who cares? The point is, uh, I think people were really over the top with the critique of the matches because, because, like you said, they don't like the booking. Yeah, and it seems like one of those things where people really like sorted themselves into camps and got really malicious about it. But like, I don't, you know, I thought this match was good. I didn't think it was like a match of the year contender. I didn't think it was like a bad match. I thought it was a good match, and I felt like you know people were being really over the top about you know this Mudo thing. So. I think overall, oh, yeah. it's not what I would have done, but the rain has been fine. Yeah. And it's over now. So hopefully the, the Mudo people, the people who really hated Mudo. Just can't you wait until he wins maybe. it back in Corrigan, baby. The semi main event, of course. Sorry, the main event, you mean? This is the real main event. This is the match that should have gone on last. Overweight title. Junagama defeated Hiroshima by TKO. With the front neck lock at 1853 is a third defense. Um, you know, this had a, a great pre match video, some choice footage of Hiroshima yes. as the map hero in his early days, uh, footage of his famous feud and storyline with Hiroshi Tanahashi. Just lots of great stuff in this video. Uh, DDT has some of the best out- video production out there. Yeah, they, they that even really predates, like, you know, th- I mean, obviously, it's impressive enough now. But even before they had, like, the cyber agent backing, yeah. they always did really cool video packages. Even, like, so. in 2015, they still had the best video packages in the yeah. world. They just really have a good video package guy, I guess. I think that might be Imanari, I think. He's one of the... I know he's one of the main video people. Hmm. But, uh, anyway, so this match started out pretty slow. Akiyama eventually gives Hiroshima DET on the ramp. It's a pretty weak one, though, because Hiroshima's head barely makes any contact with the actual ramp. Uh, June, though, makes up for it with a great running knee on the ramp to follow up. Just kills him with that. Uh, the thing at, one the point, <laughs> at one point, Hiroshima escaped the choke from Akiyama, and they just start beating the shit out of each other. Yes. That was. Uh, Hiroshima surprisingly gets the better of that exchange, and then hits sort of like a running boot version of the Somato. The same setup with Akiyama yeah. sitting there, so you're expecting the Somato, but instead he just runs over and boots him in the face. That was pretty great. Uh, unfortunately, the knee attack that Akiyama fired back with kind of barely grazed him, but then he did follow up with a perfect exploder, as usual, so that was cool. Uh, that was just before the 15-minute call. 
at the end of another big exchange, Akiyama survives the Shimato. He kicks out of 2.99. Hiroshima won't stay down after that. He kicks out of knee attacks and various exploders. Akiyama finally reapplies, though, his favorite, front, his famous uh, front neck lock, the guillotine. And Hiroshima goes out pretty quickly, so Akiyama retains via referee stoppage. I thought it was pretty awesome. I thought it took its sweet time getting going and wasn't quite up to the level I expected going in. So it's one of those matches that's like four stars flat, which is, you know, a very good rating. But because of the two, the reputation of the two guys, you're still left kind of disappointed by it. So that's where I was here. Four stars flat, a disappointing four stars flat, but, you know, still pretty awesome. I um, adored this match. Okay. I I really loved it. Um, I'm incredibly biased, though, because Hiroshima is one of my favorite wrestlers ever. Um, so whenever I get to see him, especially like, like he's always been in big positions, right? Especially in DDT. <clears throat> but now that like DDT is at like this new encroaching popularity, it, I, I love that Har- Hiroshima still gets these big time moments in these big buildings. It just feels like deserved. And whenever I get the opportunity to see it, I'm just all in. I think Akiyama's one of the best to ever do it as well. So I was going into this match super excited. I, like you said with the, the pre-match video, the Hiroshima Tanahashi uh, comparisons were like, that was just such a dope little in- intricacy to put into this. Um, Hiroshima just taking knees to the face throughout. I I thought it was an interesting choice to have like Akiyama kind of eat him up a little bit throughout. But maybe that was meant to be like a play on the whole Tanahashi stuff. But, uh, mm. yeah, I, I also think Hiroshima came out of this, like, selling like a madman and made Akiyama look great. Akiyama reminded me a lot of um, Takiyama in this match. Just kind of, like, ma- very deliberate movements, going around there, just throwing big strikes to put Hiroshima down. It's always nice to... I, I love the whole dynamic of this. I loved the, the big entrances. It felt like a really big deal, and it's just... Uh, I, yeah, I was all in on this match. I loved it. I love the knees. I love the Samatos. I love Hiroshima getting a little mean at times. I liked Akiyama basically swatting him away throughout. Good stuff. But, like, my only concern is, like, this match was so Akiyama eating up Hiroshima that it only would really make sense for Hiroshima to come back and, be- and beat him. But I don't think that's going to be the story. So it's just going to be this weird limbo stage where Hiroshima kind of looked like shit <laughs> in comparison to Akiyama here. But overall, I really liked the match. I went four and a quarter on it. Uh, one of my favorite matches from this show, but not my favorite. Sugar Ray Leonard, Roberto Duran, Marvelous Marvin Hagler, and Thomas Hearns. Legends, whose four-way rivalry defined one of the greatest eras in boxing history. Relive their decade of dominance in a new Showtime sports documentary, The Kings, a four-part series now streaming on Showtime. There you go. Uh, oh, so you went four and a quarter, you said, right? Yep. But there is a, there is a match you like better. So mm. I know it's not the next one already, so. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so this was a, uh, you know, I, I almost had another quarter star for like a disoriented Hiroshima getting up thinking the match is still going. Oh, his that post-match rocks. was so great too, yeah. like coming out of the stupor and just being broken that he that he lost. Yeah. Akiyama coming lost. out with the, um, the hammer and then wearing Yoshiko at the end of the the show. I really love that touch of like him really wanting to emphasize that, you know, I'm me, but I'm also representing DDT and I'm not afraid yeah. to represent all aspects of it. Uh, third from the top, the triple main event number one was Miyu Yamashita defeating Yuka Sakazaki with the Crash Rabbit Heat in 1636, her first defense of the Princess of Princess title. Uh, so I already know from the voice of Slack that I love this. And you just thought it was a match. But I thought this was like, this match fucking rocked. I mean, I, you know, I tweeted out while I was watching it, but like all of my malaise for Japanese wrestling in the past month, like gradually left me as this match went on. It was just like, my big takeaway from the show in general was like, wow, I really want to watch more Tokyo Joshi again. But like this match was so fucking good. They do this pre-match entrance video. With all that early Tokyo Joshi footage of both girls, both come from the original tiny class. That was great. That already got me into it right from the start. And then they come out, they do this great like MMA style grappling. 
these two just have come so okay. You didn't like that apparently. I but just, they two, I'll sorry, get to it later. That's okay. That's all right. Okay, but these two just have come so fucking far from where they were when they could barely do a fucking wrist lock, and here they are doing this MMA style grappling that I thought was great. Um, Miyu then just kicks the crap out of Yuka for a while. Um, you know, she also makes some time for this sick Fujiwara armbar too. Uh, Yuka finally counters her coming off the ropes with some kind of crazy snap power slam that almost drops me on her head instead of her back. The, people might even call that a botch and maybe it was a little sloppy or something, but I want, it was one of those like sloppy moves that like looked badass. So it's like, who cares? Like when you see, you know, Kawada doing the fucking dropping Masao on his head was a botch too. And, you know, nobody cares about that because it looked awesome. That's what mm. I thought here, too. It didn't look great. Um, Miyu, they get this high-speed counter sequence that really rolled. And at one point when Yuka is perched on the top rope, probably for her match with Girl Splash, Miyu just hits this crazy roundhouse kick right to the head. But Yuka no-sells it, hits the springboard drop kick, uh, you know, instead of the uh, match with Girl Splash. So that was great stuff. And then Yuka hits this super-fast superplex, uh, from the post out of the apron, that looks like it sucked for me. I mean, that, that she just hits the uh, the the apron with this thud, and it's just like, wow, what a superplex! Uh, Miu then, or Yuka immediately follows up with a sliding lariat on the apron. It's just really amazing stuff. Uh, unfortunately, we get the one big botch of the match where Yuka she goes for the mag- magical girl splash from all the way across the ring uh, and can't quite get it. She like lands on her feet and just kind of weakly splashes her. Now, if she tries it a second time, I don't really mind that in this sequence, in this uh, context, because, like, she didn't have to actually do anything to repeat the spot. Like, I hate when wrestlers repeat spots where it's like, you know... They repeat the setup as well as the... They repeat the setup, exactly. Like, you can make this work in character, like, where you is like, okay, I didn't quite hit my splash, Miu's still down, so I'm going to go back and hit my splash, and she hit it perfectly the second time. That actually makes sense if this was real. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, when if the the spot had been Yuka was supposed to run on Miyu out of a power bomb and they fucked it up and they're like, well, Miyu's like, like, let me just go for a power bomb again so you can run me out of it in the exact same manner. I've seen that a million times. That fucking sucks. That's where repeating the spot is really bad. Here, it's not a big deal because you know it still makes sense from an uh, in you know an in character standpoint. Uh, then Miyu kind of like on the mat goes from the mat and just gets this like crazy kick. Right to the jaw of Yuka mm. while Yuka's looking for some kind of hold. That was just an amazing looking spot. They just elbow the shit out of each other at one point. A, a lot harder than you see in some of these other patty cake elbow exchanges in Japanese wrestling. And Miyu hits it, another roundhouse kick. Yuka comes back with her own surprising spin kick to the gut, which apparently was like some kind of weird Demon Slayer reference according to the announcers. I was like, okay, I haven't seen the movie, so I don't know. I've seen like three episodes of the show, so I, I really have to watch the rest of it. Uh, Yuka then go, goes for the Magical Girl 450 splash, but uh, Miyu rolls out of the way. Uh, but then Yuka immediately hits a roaring elbow when they both get back up. Uh, but Miyu comes back with another huge kick, an enormous release German suplex. Uh, but then Yuka ducks a spin kick and hits her arm clutch, like, spitty slam thingy. And I don't know, she has a name for it, I don't know what it's called. But Miyu kicks out of it anyway. And then Miyu murders Yuka with the skull kick, but can't cover. And then Yuka ends up uh, grabbing the bottom rope to break. And then soon after that, Miyu finally hits the Crash Rabbit Heat for the pin. Four and a half stars. This was the Ooh. best match of the show. It was the best match on either show. I thought this was incredible. Really, really physical. Great grappling early on. And it just really hit that, that like, uh, you know, epic pro wrestling big show title match feeling without wearing out its welcome or ever getting hokey like so many of these do. And I don't know, I love this match. I mean, it might make my top 10 match of the year list. I have to go uh, take a look at it and see if it knocks anything. If it does, it'll be towards the bottom of the list. But it definitely is going to, uh, it's in the conversation. Because this is, I thought this was an incredible match. Uh, and these are also two wrestlers that I love a lot. So, I mean, you know, I'm not going to pretend I'm not biased. But, uh, you know, I saw some people going four and a half and four and three quarters on uh, Grapple when I checked. It was more more common to see, like, four stars and four and a quarter. But, you know. I love this match. So that is the rating I gave it. And that's very, that's fine. <laughs> um, okay. You gave it to me, I know. No, no, no. Okay. So I oh. did <laughs> my first watch through. I rewatched it again 
not after watching, you know, four hours of other wrestling. And I enjoyed <laughs> it way more. Um, yeah, I sat down at the first watch through. I think I was really burnt out at this point on the show. Because mm. the end part of the the mid card was just such a slog to get through. Mm. Um, and once I had got to this point, I was already like kind of checked out. So when I came back and rewatched it, I ended up enjoying it a ton more. Like, there's a lot of stuff I really liked in this. There was some stuff I like. It was there was some real sloppy moments in it, and I'm not just talking about like the big botch. There was like some weird like I didn't like the grappling. I thought the grappling didn't look particularly great. There was parts in it that did, but I thought for the most part it was kind of uh, you know it felt like grappling for the sake of grappling. I thought there was some really fantastic selling in this match. I also think there was some pretty bad selling in this match. Um, I thought uh, Sakazaki looked great. I, I think Sakazaki is one of the, like, again, one of the most complete pro wrestlers out there right now. I think she's got like every nuance down. But I was a little disappointed with um, Miyu in this match. I felt like she took a lot to get going. She got there by the end of it, but I thought the the build-up was weirdly structured and it maybe like it even exposed her a little bit just with how it went. I don't know. I just wasn't really vibing with Miu until the end of the match where I thought she really started putting it in and when she started going, she really helped rise it to that next level. But that middle stage was just so weird for me. Um, I really like both women too. So like, I don't want it to sound like I'm just like shitting on them for the sake of shitting on them. But, um, it's also, I, you know, I'm not a massive Tokyo Joshi watcher. I, I've tried to watch more now. Um, I want to thank uh, Joe Shizzle on YouTube, who does like these 40 minute uh, storyline videos on the history of these characters. And so that's like how I've been getting my Tokyo Joshi knowledge in. So I, I, I haven't seen a ton of them wrestling, but I've seen them on their big spots on like the DDT shows. And I've seen... The I've only just started watching the the Kurikans. but yeah, for the most part, I I I ended up really liking it. But it just had some weird structury stuff, some weird pacing stuff throughout it. But overall, like you know, third from the top title match, I thought it like it delivered perfectly for where it was on the card. I think I went like four after the end. Like I jumped it up a whole star. That's how much I enjoyed it. Oh, there you go. That's, a, that's a much better rating. Thank you. Yeah, glad you've come to the light. <laughs> Uh, match number nine on the show was the the last DDT versus Noah interpromotional match, which was Kanosuke Takashita and Yuki Ueno from DDT defeating Kaido Kiyomiya and Yoshiki Inamura. Ueno pinned in, uh, Kiyomiya with the BME in 1751. In a beautiful BME, too. <laughs> yeah. I feel like you could probably close your eyes and imagine this match. It was like all back and forth action, uh, big head drops, like a big release German from Kaito to Ueno. Uh, Itamura was being a big boy, you know, doing big boy stuff. Uh, very, you know, I'm not trying to say it was like a bad, it, it was awesome, but like, I feel like it was very much like, you know, if you know these guys, you kind of probably know what, ma- what kind of match they did here. Uh, Kiyomi at one point just comes fucking flying out of, from out of frame with this springboard drop kick from the other side of the ring uh, to a hanging in a tree of Woe Takashita. Just a crazy looking spot. And then Ueno pins Kiyomiya, Surely not a finish I would have predicted, but it's a ballsy one, uh, you know, because it both continues uh, Ueno's big push up the card, and they're also doing the slump storyline with Kiyomiya as well. Uh, so in hindsight, maybe maybe it should have been more predictable, but I did th- I was pretty stunned by it. Uh, it ended up making the final score of the uh, all the matches 3-2 Noah, which we'll get to the other ones, obviously. But yeah, this match was awesome. Uh, just nonstop action. Not much of a story to it, really, but I don't, I don't think you needed one here. It's just four young guys going all out here. So I went four and a quarter. Awesome match. Um, so this was my favorite match of the night. Um, like, and if like it's it's two of my favorite wrestlers currently wrestling. Like Kiyomiya, I he's a guy that I watch and I just see young Tanahashi. Like from yeah, his movements, so his connection to the crowd, his like kind of cocky charisma that he's developing. And Takeshita is like I again like another guy that I have like in my top five you know like and we know like someone who's really come out of his shell and turned into a top guy in DDT himself now you know what I mean like 
Inamora was the only one that I was like, I like Inamora, but he's not. A, I don't hold him to the same standard as the other three people in this match. But I loved it. I loved the opening exchanges with Kiyomiya and Takeshita. That like the the young aces showing off and doing their own thing before Ueno and Inamura came in and started. You know, which because they kind of felt like you know um, Inamura and Ueno had a a point to prove from being in this match. They came in with an intensity that I thought that I thought really matched the two bigger stars. I thought this match had perfect escalation. I thought the pace was insane. I thought everyone came into this, came out of this looking great, looking um, like they had, uh, especially when I had, like, I thought this was star making for him. Like, I think if you watch DDT, you already know that this guy's a star, but like, you know, he was in there with the other ace from another promotion now, basically. Just great stuff all around. And he, and he stood out too with um, his great, his drop kick was insane. One of the best drop kicks I've ever seen. He, um, his two BMEs were both great. I thought he like legitimately broke some ribs on the one where Kiyomiya threw his knees up. I think, yeah, it's out of this, everyone came out of this looking great. I think there's a lot of money to be made in these guys continuing to wrestle after this. I think something with Kiyomiya and Takeshita would be like a smart direction to go in in the long term. Maybe like you drop it for a bit and you bring it back later. But I think those two, like that, that, that screams money to me, and I think a Kiyomiya Ueno singles match also screams money to me, which I think they might be setting up because in the post-match comments, they kind of call each other out a little bit. But overall, yeah. I, I love this tag. I went four and a half on it, low-end match of the year for me. Um, it's just one of those oh, matches wow. that I'm just going to keep re-watching over and over and over again. Well, there you go. So a little bit higher than even I was, but I thought it was awesome. You know what it reminded uh, me of? Um, wow. The Tanahashi... Uh, Miyahara tag with Sekimoto and Yoshitatsu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, like, it, it was a tag match to, like, hide a singles match in, kind of, but the other mm-hmm. guys kept their, their like, they, they, they managed to keep in there the whole time. Like, I, I think I also went four and a half on that match. Like, I'm just, a, I'm a big sucker for these interpromotional aces versus aces stuff. It's, it's my favorite thing in wrestling. There you go. Uh, match number eight, the DDT versus Congo full scale 12 man tag team match. Shinshiro Takagi, Akito, Kasan Higuchi, Yugi Sakaguchi, Na- uh, Naomi Yoshimura, and Yugi Naya. What the fuck was he doing there? Defeat Kano, Kazuki, and really Nakajima. Good with Takagi, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Manabu Soya, uh, Hao, Neo, and Tadasuke went to Kagi Pantawa with the sit down Himawari bomb in 19. 19- 59. This was fucking awesome. Yeah. And so many levels. I mean, this was so fucking good. So that tease I made earlier about the, uh, you know, the spot and the, the, the announcing call of the night, that was one of my favorite calls in forever. So the, uh, the Congo team comes out first. They're in the red. DHT comes out, T, DHT team comes out second. They all gather on the stage and they all have all these wacky weapons. Perfect. Takagi has the dramatic dream cycle. Uh, Akito has the, the Giga Hammer. Fucking Yuki Onai is wearing two bat wings for some reason. They're all they all look ridiculous. And one of the announcers, Mark Pickering, he goes, "Oh, you know, Kano is not going to like this. I'm not even going to try to imitate his accent." But he just goes, "Yeah, Kano is not going to like this. He's going to hate this." And as soon as he says it, the camera cuts to Kano, and he is staring up the stage, up this ramp. And he just starts screaming in rage. Like, if you can't hear what he's saying, all the theme music, like, but he's just like fucking, uh, just a nonstop string of Japanese curse words, what I'm imagining. Just screaming up this ramp angrily with that, his like most serious, uh, Kano face possible. And it's like one of the fucking, one of the funniest things because it was again perfectly timed. The moment Mark Pickering said that, it's not like they were producing it to do that. They probably don't even know. You know, the cameraman probably had no idea what's going on with the English announcers. And the more Mark Pickering says, you know, Kano's not going to like this, the camera cuts to Kano's just like in a rage, like a, a frothy rage at all these stupid DDT weapons just screaming up the rampway, uh, even though they can't even hear him. It was like, wow. It shows a, that a really good understanding <laughs> of the characters in Noah. Yeah. Bro, like, like, I, no, I, I must have annoyed them in some way to get blocked, but I will give them credit uh, <laughs> that they, these guys clearly understand the brand now. 
and yeah. they understand the the nuances to these characters and especially like I think obviously they were a little out of depth with the DDT stuff because they don't do it but yeah. um the well, Noah stuff I feel, I, feel like that's what, I feel like that's what they had Bali on Aki and yeah. uh, the other guy Hiroshi I think his name was I could be wrong yeah but uh the the, the journalist and they both really like they, they kind of did like you know they they knew when to lay out and let them explain the DDT and Tokyo Joshi stuff so that was you know but I, I I just wanted to give them some credit I think they they were Really good in all of the Noah stuff today too. Yeah, actually, I'm just. I think they've done Tokyo Joshi before. I think I'm just, I think it's just DHA. yeah. I, they do do some uh, Tokyo yeah. Joshi English commentary. Yeah, so it was it was really just a DUT where like they would let Bal- Bali on Aki, and uh, you know the uh, the Japanese journalists really carry the load on the storyline stuff. Um, match of course started out with a big wild brawl, and Yoshimura. I thought he was a major standout here. Uh, he did like a bunch of moves with one guy hanging off him in a sleeper hole. He did this awesome high speed hip toss. I think it has a specific name, but I don't know what it is. Uh, Yuki Onaya. So they, theirs is a spot that was basically like a parody of a ref bump. So the, the Noah ref is in there, okay? So it's the Noah ref, not the DDT ref. And he's telling like Akito, no, you can't use the hammer. And Akito apparently just said, like, but this is DDT. Like that was this is DDT. <laughs> yeah. And Yuki Onaya, he takes a common rider esque mask, like a common rider buddy mask or something, and puts it over the ref's face. And then Higuchi sets a fucking bear trap for his foot for the referee to step into. And somehow being bl- literally blinded and put at, and being set in a bear trap is not a disqualification. I thought that was like. Well, he an couldn't amazing... prove he did it, could he? Can I could have set true, the bear trap? True. There you go. Kano could have set the bear trap. It was a perfect parody of a of a ref bump. Just an amazing, amazing spot. Um, then we had the highlight of wrestling this year. And I really don't say that. Uh, maybe that's not saying much, but it is. A, it was an amazing moment. Kano used the dramatic dream cycle. First of all, that's great heel hypocr- hip, uh, hypocrisy. You know, with like, oh, I hate all these weapons, but I'm going to use the cycle. Just great, great, great on that level. But also, then he, he, sorry, go ahead. Uh, jump uh, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, I'd also think it, he did it in a way that made sense because he was like, you know, I'm not here for the, the, the yucks, but you know what? You know what I am here for? Riding a bicycle full speed <laughs> into someone because that's going to hurt. <laughs> he rides it right into Takagi's gut and then he does a double foot stomp on the bicycle. <laughs> they really struggled to break it though, didn't they? <laughs> they really did struggle, but the, the foot stomp is so great. Then they all start stomping and trying to break it. Uh, then uh, Sakaguchi gets a double choke sleeper on Kano <laughs> using Yoshihiko, which was so amazing. It was like basically a fuck you to Kano. Like, you know what, bitch? You, you say you hate all this shit so much, well, you're going to be choked out by a doll, bitch. <laughs> it's like Ugh. such a great moment. I'm sure there's a great, a great photo moment. of that out there somewhere that I have to track yeah. down. Uh, Takagi then hits that electric chair powerbomb on Hao, and that is the pin. Uh, the sight of Kano going out for the uh, for the dog choke, like I said, just amazing. This match rocked. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was this was okay. We're gonna get to the rest of the other card in a second. Uh, it probably won't take us very much time to talk about some of these matches, but uh, it you know it was a lot of matches that were just fine to good. But this was where the ma- the show like really uh, picked up and took a turn for the better. I mean, this match, you know, finally uh, felt like the show was really turning a corner here. And honestly, if you want to, if you're, you're a little short on time, you could easily skip right to this match and watch the rest of the show and you know have a great time. And you, you really not miss much of anything. I mean, there's some stuff on the end of the card that was pretty good, but like really, this is where the show really uh, kicks in the high gear here with match eight of the main show. Uh, but yes, this was four and a quarter on this kicks as well. in at match eight. <laughs> yes, uh, really match eleven because there were three on three dark matches too. Uh, but yes, four and a quarter stars on this. Uh, just an absolutely awesome, awesome match. It was also DDT's first win after Noah had already won the series by going three and zero. You know, this was just a battle of the the super serious Congo versus the DDT All Star. Such a great story. And the action was great, and just everything about this was great. It was so funny. Uh, this was perfect. So four and a quarter stars. I greatly enjoyed this match. I'm the complete the same. Like, I loved all of this. It felt like it was super serious Noah Congo wrestler guys coming out here and just facing the absolute spirit of DDT wackiness. 
Um, Takagi, like, it's it's funny. If it was, like, anyone else putting, like, themselves in storylines like this, you'd be, like, so sick of it by now. But he's such a likable guy that you're, like, fully into it and you fully support him in everything he does, right? I, yeah. the, the whole match was great. I loved the the moment where Sakaguchi and Kano were just staring each other down and Takagi's trying to crawl his way into the stare down and just getting the shit slapped out of him by uh, Kano. <laughs> um, I really, I want to give a little shout out to how Neo and uh, to, to, oh my God, why am I blanking on? Uh, Tadasuke, right? Um, I thought they had some really cool junior combos together in there too. Uh, from mm-hmm. three guys that I don't particularly love that much. Like, I, trust me, I love me some Haruki, but that's about it. Um, I really enjoyed the the final spot with Sakaguchi getting the choke on and, and Kano just reaching out to uh, the pinfall. I thought that was really cool. I really want Eruption to, like, wrestle Nakajima and Kano now. I need that on, like, some Kurokan Hole show at some point. Because I thought, like, Nakajima brought it this entire match, too. Like, he's a, I think he gets a little uh, undervalued or underutilized in Noah, to say it plainly. <laughs> but I think here he was really good as, like, the other guy who was really not taking any shit from this. Just throwing those kicks in on uh, Takagi throughout. Yeah, just, I really liked all of it. It's nice to see my boy, Manabe Soya in such a big stage after not really seeing him do anything for so long. So yeah, I just, Mm -hmm. I I love this match too. I also went four and a quarter. There you go. Uh, Match number seven, this was the the team of Daisuke Sasaki, Tetsuya Endo, and Soma Takao from Damn Nation, defeating Chris Brooks, Shuma Katsumata, and Mao. uh, When Sasaki submitted Mao with the crossover face lock in 14 at 36, this one, when they brought them out here and they announced them as uh, Sana Kamina, I was like, oh, I finally get it. Mm. It'll be 3 7 Kamina because that's uh, 3 7 in Japanese sounds like sauna. Mm-hmm. It took me like three months to <laughs> figure this out for some reason. I don't know why that them announcing it here finally got through to my head. But this is a big uh, stage. I finally, uh, I finally noticed it. And I was like, what the hell does 3 7 Kamina mean? And I was like, oh, God, yeah, it sounds like sauna. I liked yeah. the, the backstory of Brooks isn't able to enjoy saunas with them because of Japan's tattoo policy. <laughs> that is true. It's That's a good solid. subtext to the group. <laughs> yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the, the first highlight of note for me in this match was a pretty ma- major botch. So Pauly runs in uh, to try and do a dive for the floor, which uh, which probably would have been fatal for multiple people, maybe including Pauly. Uh, Mal and Brooks slide in the ring, and they were supposed to hit a double super kick on him, but Brooks's super kick missed by maybe a thousand feet, <laughs> maybe give or take. Uh, just one of the worst missed super kicks I've ever seen. Like he could not have come further away from his head if he was trying to. Uh, at least, I, I guess, if you're going to miss a super kick by that amount, at least it's a double super kick, or like the guy is is really just selling, I guess, at that point for the other guy's super kick. Mm. It's not like the guy had to sell for. Uh, just your missed super kick, so you know it could have been worse, I guess. But boy, did he miss that super kick by a, a trillion feet or so. Um, but yeah, they Mao then got one of those uh plastic boxes of death and hit a crazy springboard attack to poor Sasaki on the floor with it. And that, that thing just burst into a million pieces on, on impact there. Uh, and Sasaki did end up tapping out Mao with his cross face after Polly had saved him from being pinned by Mao a few minutes earlier by pulling the ref out of the ring. Uh, I know there's a very fun sex fan tag, lots of action. Uh, that horrible Miss Super Kick aside, I went three and a half stars on this. I thought it was good. Uh, I, got, I got nothing to say about it. <laughs> like, exactly. it, this was like, this match and the, the match before it, I was just like, get to the top five now. Like, <laughs> I, I had no time for mid-card junior division Noah stuff and mid-card damnation stuff. Uh, at this point well, in the show. The oh, was, yeah, well, I, I see. I think <laughs> one simple change would have made this so much better if they just did Damnation versus Stinger and 37K <laughs> versus uh, Katake, Harada, and Ohara. That would have just, like, yeah, that would have saved they just it. just didn't want to overdo the, the international stuff, I don't know. But, like, but. I just feel, I feel like, de- like the 
the back and forth of damnation and the stinger would have been very funny because they're all so surly and yeah. and i i think like i i realized that you probably you couldn't do Katogo harada and ohara versus damnation because that's the three junior champs versus damnation i don't think either team could lose in that circumstance really but yeah. you could do uh the other this, you could do the inverse around that and get yeah. away with it fine i think because damnation can beat stinger and you can have any of the junior guys pin any of the the sauna boys the sauna boys and the man not allowed to sauna mm. <laughs> but yeah uh, I, I, it was it was fun but like i was pretty much sick of it at this point uh match number six was the noah six man junior tag uh the team of katoge harada and hajimahara beating singer ogawa hayata and seki yoshioka uh, harada pinned yoshioka with the katayama german suplex in 1333. This one I did not love. Uh, Harada and Ohara, you know, they won the, uh, Harada and Ohara, they won the GFC Junior Tag title recently from Ogawa and Hayata. On May in a pretty 1st. good match. Uh, to be fair. Yeah, I haven't seen that one, honestly. So that ended their six month reign. So as you mentioned, this trio, the Momo, Momo no Station trio, I guess, they have all the junior gold since Kotoki is, of course, the junior single champion. He won it back in March from Yoshioka. Uh, a lot of this match was, you know, the Stinger team working on Ohara's leg. I get it. It was fine, but I probably would not do a leg match and a random undercard six-man uh, nine matches into a 15-match show, kind of the end, kind of dark matches. It's really hard to keep my attention with so much wrestling already and so much more to come at this point. So, you know, especially an undercard six-man tag with nothing on the line. But, yes, Harada pinned Yoshioka with the German suplex. Uh, the match did finally get going a bit after the endless, like, uh, leg stuff. But not enough for me to go higher than like two or three quarters. It was there. Yeah, I I, I liked this one uh, more than I like most of Noah's junior six man stuff, um, because uh, it's just that it's weird. Like for a, a division that has like a couple influx of talent, it's just so stagnant. Still, I think it's because mm-hmm. there's no there's no moving on in Noah. You know what I mean? Like people rarely get out of the position that they're in. Like, mm-hmm. I love Harada. I think Harada is one of the best in the world. I think Kotoge is also there. H- Ohara is real good. Um, Yoshi- he never gets to do anything. Yeah. He's finally junior tag champion, I guess. Like, yeah, that's the thing. He's finally getting to do something, right? <laughs> so I, I, I really like these guys, but it just feels like we've seen these combinations for the past five years, you know? <laughs> like... Yeah, I, I I would. This is I'm at the point now where like I've been asking for Harada to just go heavyweight for like three years. I'm like, it, if there was any sort of semblance of these people moving up at all or leaving or doing anything, I think it would really help with the perception I have with Noah. Like it's not even just uh, the junior division, really. It's like this whole company just feels so stale. And I think a part of that is just, you know, the people that have been there have been there forever and the new guys haven't really stood out to the level that you'd hope. Like, I love Yoshioka. I love him in Strong Hearts. I loved him in Wrestle One. His cruiserweight stuff with Andy Wu was fantastic. Um, Mazada. Like, all that stuff was great. But, um, yeah, it's just... It's hard to get excited about the about Noah and especially their junior division, even though they've got a lot of really good talent. Uh, match number five from Tokyo Joshi. This I liked a lot. Maki Ito, Yuki Kamifuku, and Marika Kobashi beating Hikari Noah, Mizuki, and Yuki Arai. Ito submitted Arai with the Ito Punish in 1302. It's just a Boston crowd. So, for people who don't know, with a knee. Yuki Arai, <laughs> with a knee, with a knee. Yuki Arai is an actual idol, like a current idol, not a fired idol, like Maki Ito. Uh, she is an idol from SKE48 and AKB48 sister group. So, you know, not they're not the superpower in the Japanese pop scene. They used to be mostly because of that uh, that stalking scandal from a couple of years ago. But they're still, you know, they're still around. I mean, they, it, it's a weird story because the AKB group kind of made their own replacement. Because uh, I can't remember the name of it now. They, they made like another, a new idol group. That if I had my friend Ethan on here, he'd be able to read, do this all chapter and verse. But like they they did they put out a new idol group that I can't remember the name of now that kind of replaced AKB as far as like popularity goes as like the number one like mainstream idol group. And 
I guess it's nice. Like, they probably still make for them. It's probably fine because they still make all the money. I guess but for the actual, you know, uh, they don't. It's not as great. You know, I mean, they're, not that they ever do that well to begin with. But uh, anyway, so Yuki Arai, she's from a she's from like an idol group that's uh, used to be the big hotness and is a little bit down on, on its luck right now. I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, but she de- she debuted back on May fourth in Tokyo Joshi. Now they said she was going to wrestle about once per month to balance her pro wrestling and idol careers. That's already changed. She's already wrestling more this month because she was like, I don't know. She she said she said she didn't want to fall behind or something. She was watching all these other wrestlers and getting excited. So uh, you know, That's she's cool. already wrestling more. Yeah, than once a month. Also, uh, Jarita Matsuri is here on Japanese commentary. They saw her at ringside, and she was also from the same uh, idol group. I mean, she's graduated, oh. but she of course is the one who uh, used to like follow Kenny Omega around and always made me wonder. When is she uh, going to Tokyo Joshi, again? John? Break the scoop yeah. right now. I don't, I don't know. Mm. But uh, Maki Ito flipped her off her inside while she and her teammates were all choking Yuki Rai in the ropes. That was pretty hilarious. Um, I thought this was all kinds of fun. Wacky bumps. Uh, Yuki did her awesome a- axe kick on Ito. And that like awesome axe kick was like what made Shinshiro Takagi approach her about becoming a wrestler in the first place because uh, you know she was briefly Iron Man heavy metal weight champion and she did that axe kick and Takagi was like, he saw dollar signs, I guess. <laughs> uh, so basically the idea here is, I, I think it's like a start of an idol versus idol feud between Maki and Yuki. And like Ko- Marika Kobashi and Yuki Kamifuku, this trio, Ma- uh, Maki Ito, uh, Kobashi, and Kamifuku, they're like the closest thing Tokyo Joshi has to heels other than, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, Saki-sama, who's only around sometimes. So, you know, they were like really going laying into it here. They were just like, you know, choking in the ropes and just being total assholes throughout this entire match. And they're all very good at it. Uh, it, it seems like they're not quite a unit because they, they did, like, argue in the backstage segment uh, that followed. Like, <laughs> not really argue, but, like, Yuki Kamifuku basically told her, we don't, we don't want to call you Sama anymore, which means, like, you know, when they say Maki-sama, it's almost like saying Maki the God or Lord Maki or something. And it's like, they, don't, they didn't really like calling her that. And they told her, she, they basically doesn't she have her enough her. of that on Twitter? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, they told her she got carried away, but they had fun. And then Maki Ito, like, stood there looking stunned. It was great. <laughs> but, yeah, she ends up making uh, Yuki Arai tap out to that gnarly-looking Boston crowd, uh, which makes sense. It's a good finish, given their experience gap. And it's crazy now that Maki Ito is now the, the veteran in the feud. <laughs> but uh, this, was, this was good. I went three and a half stars on it. Really enjoyed it, especially the, dyna- the dynamic between uh, Ito and Yuki Arai. And then Ito even like flipped her off again at ringside. Just want to look like the two sides are being like a little respectful. Uh, so you know, I, I enjoy this a lot. Yeah, um, I didn't really know many people in this. I knew Ito obviously, and I knew uh, Mizuki, but it was my first time seeing uh, Kabashi and Kamafuku. Kamafuku is that so Koba- Kobashi, yeah, Kami- so Marika Kobashi, she was in Tokyo Joshi years back. Uh, before she was under 18, actually. And, you know, they, they, they uh, build her as, like, the pro wrestler of the 21st century and all that because she was born in the 21st century. Um, and then she took a break to do, like, college entrance, entrance exams. And it's like, okay, well, I don't know if we're ever going to see her again. But then, like, last year she came back. Like, late, middle, middle I'll say the mid to late last year she came back. Mm. Uh, now a college student instead of a high schooler. And she's been great since she came back too. So I mean, I, I thought she was great before she, uh, before she took her break, but she's been great since she came back too. So. I thought they um they all looked really good um in the match, and they all looked really good together as like uh, a package deal. I thought so. I I did really enjoy it. I just I didn't really know what was happening for most of it. <laughs> I just got like I was like I I understand the shenanigans, so. From that aspect, I was into it, but yeah, I, I was just—it's just me seeing people for the first time, really, and trying to gauge reactions on them. Uh, match four was Masa Kitamiya beating Hideki Okatani and uh, two twenty-five with the jail hold, jail lock, whatever you want to call it. Um, it was a weird mismatch, Kitamiya against a DET rookie, but it was a last-minute match from Kitamiya breaking off of Congo recently, splitting up the aggression tag team at Nakajima. So just a squash for Kitamiya. He won in two seconds with the prison lock. Uh, not really enough of a match to rate to me. 
But this meant Noah already won the series 3-0 yeah. at this point with two matches remaining, which I thought was kind of funny. I'm absolutely disgusted that uh, Big Noah coming into this this mum and pop operation here, forcing <laughs> their stories upon us. There you go. Uh, Matt, anything else to say about this match? No, I mean, I didn't... Uh, why was it even on here? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, match number three, Takashi Sugera and Kazuchi Sakuraba defeating Danjo Godino and Super Sasango Machine. Sugera pins Sasadango with the Olympic Slam in 925. <laughs> the second DET Noah match. So Dino had a suitcase with him for some reason. I don't even know if that was ever explained. He also had hit these Cried Bun themed tassels for his tight shot. I really like those. Uh, Sasadango gave us a PowerPoint presentation before the match, basically admitting he and Dino have no chance against their opponents in a normal wrestling match. But instead, they're trying to win a battle of ideologies. Yeah, just and like Kenny and Tanahashi. Yeah. He introduced plastic bags for spinning. Uh, cosplay gear for Sakuraba's favorite actress, uh, Tokia, uh, Tokiwa Takako. And of course, he has the pantyhose, the very important pantyhose. Uh, so Sakuraba's seen playing once again in Saitama Super Arena. Pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, for the old, back to the old school pride days. And he and Sugara both start wrestling under these uh, old school masks. And then, you know, Dino keeps trying to lock up with Sugara. Can't get any hold of them at all. They both tag out and then, uh, or uh, trying to tag out, sorry. He was trying to uh, lock up with Sakuraba and couldn't get any hold of them at all. They both tag out, Sugara and Sasadango. They circle each other. They lock up for literally like half a second, maybe even a quarter of a second. And Dino immediately like, let's go. And it's like, I can't, I can't, he's too strong. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, that was so fucking funny. He demands the bats to do the spinning. Uh, Sasadango starts spinning. Sugara just stares at him and finally just hits him in the ass with the bat. That was pretty funny. Uh, but yeah, Sugara ends up pinning Sasadango here in a short, but wacky tag team match. Pretty funny. I enjoyed it. It was also 2 0 now at this point. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought this was a lot of fun. I I think the, the, the Dino stuff can get a little tiring, but. I like the whole theme. They, they didn't of, do a lot of it here. Yeah, that's the thing. They, they they kept it to a minimum, and they focused on what I thought was actually a very cool trope, which was like the super serious versus the fools, you know, and Segura getting involved in it while also like being self loathing about it and going backstage and saying that he apologizes for having such a shitty match and how is he going to go home and face his wife now? <laughs> like, because <laughs> like stuff like that, I just thought was really funny. Um, and then he showed up at the end of the night in the pantyhose. Yeah, that was okay. hilarious. Yeah, so yeah. And he put he put in the mask over the pantyhose, <laughs> like yeah. just stuff like that. Like it's good fun, and I liked Dino's comment. Oh, I don't forget who it was. It was one of them um, backstage afterwards, where they were like, you know, uh, I don't think Noah and DDT are as separate ideology as we think we are. You know, there's a bit of us in them and a bit of them in us, and. That's the kind of the, the message that I thought was actually kind of nice to come away from this. Overall, it was real fun, and it was um, it stood out as far as the mid card stuff to me. Uh, match two, a three way tag team match from Tokyo Joshi. Shogo Nakajima and Hyper Misao defeated Rika Tatsumi and Mia Watanabe and Nodoka Tema and Yuki Aino when Nakajima pinned Aino with the diving senton in 804. Um, you know, Miyu and Raku, they had a really wacky spot to show off Miyu's power, where Riku leaps off the top rope into Miyu's arms, and she essentially, like, moves her own partner to each side of her body without dropping her, and then just throws her an opponent in the corner. <laughs> uh, a little stupid, but also still impressive. Miyu is like, I don't know. She, I, you look at her, and you're like, I can see how you're strong, but sometimes I can't see how you're that strong. <laughs> it's like It's like a Superman situation where she has, like, magic strength powers or something. It's just very... Sometimes it's a I think bizarre. Yuka has that too. <laughs> yeah, so that's a good point. Y- Yuka might even have even more than me. Because, like, but, Yuka, uh, like, she will do some, like, crazy lifts, and you're like, how did you bust that out so quickly and so smoothly? Yeah. There you go. Uh, Shoko ends up pinning Yuki Aino with a top rope senton, uh, coming back after it looked like Yuki had her beat. But there's a perfectly fun little free right tie. I said three stars on it. Yeah, I, I I thought it was fun. Um, I really like seeing Shoko Nakajima because, 
like I've only really just been exposed to her. Like the first time I saw her was on that one random AEW shot that she did. Um, but I, I really like her. Um, Hyper Masao, I knew her from her. Um, oh, please forgive me for the forgetting the name. Um, the group of Saki Sama. Uh, John Saki-sama, save me. Yes. I don't. I, I can't think of it either. Uh, uh, oh, the uh, Bishiki, uh, Bish Bish uh, Neo Bishiki. Yeah, uh, I I <laughs> yeah. I wasn't even gonna attempt it. I, <laughs> I don't like to be on the spot, sir. Don't put me on the spot. I'm so sorry, but um, yeah. I overall I thought um like I I, I preferred her in like that kind of thing, but overall like again I'm learning who these people are. I like um Joko a lot. I like Rika a lot. I thought she was really cool in the big uh, Kuroka match that I saw. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I like uh, this... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? This... Well, they present one thing with a lot of these characters, but these characters are actually a lot more in-depth than you think. Like, you see yeah, them yeah. very... Sur- like, y- you'd be forgiven for looking at them and seeing the surface level of it, but then there's actually a lot more depth. going on that they reward you with. They have depth. Yeah, and I, uh, that's what I really am appreciating about Tokyo Joshi specifically is the depth that these characters have. And um, I'm looking forward to getting more knowledge of it. Uh, match number one on this show was the the opener of the main card, uh, another DT Noah battle. Junta Miyawaki and Kenya Okada from Noah beat Yuki Ino and Toei Kojima from DDT. Miyawaki submitted Koji on a cross arm breaker. In 739, kind of the young guy battle here. Um, I thought it was all right, just kind of just a match. I went two and three quarters. I wasn't that impressed with this. See, I, I I really like this. I like, um, I mean, like I wasn't like you know match the year in it or anything, but I I really liked the whole aesthetic of um the young guys from each company going down there to prove something. I'm really high on Kenya Okada. I really think that guy's great and should be in a better position. Um. And yeah, we had um, you know coming in here looking like Big E. It was great. They just busted out some big shots on each other. I wouldn't mind a Kenya, uh, you know, singles match at some point. I think Kojima is really good. He's been like the most impressive rookie DDT has produced in a while for me. I think like even he's like his third match or something. I was like, this guy has something. He's gonna be real good. Yeah, I just like um, the young guys going out there. It felt like they were trying to earn it real good. I'm very worried that Junta is just going to turn into this grizzled lower mid card vet overnight, and we'll all be like, "Oh yeah, so this is really where he peaked, huh?" Because um, <laughs> couldn't you just see it? Possible. Couldn't you see him just like overnight? He's just old oh, yeah. now, and he never got a chance. That, what? that was like Gemba, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. You know what? He was just suddenly like he was suddenly like, "Oh yeah, he's just been here forever." Or um, Sato. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like I feel like he, he might just end up going down the Noel tradition of just overnight being a guy who was never got above his station. But he's in the yeah. um, the group with Katoge and stuff as like a a foursome. So hopefully together yeah. he'll be able to keep relevant. <laughs> but yeah, Kenya Okada, great. <laughs> uh, then we have the dark matches. So the dark main. I don't know if you can hear this, but it just started pouring down rain. Oh. Also, uh, no, sorry, it's hailing. Oh, uh, well, I have, a, I have a hockey update for you, Liam. Oh. The Montreal Canadiens have won in overtime over the Winnipeg Wait, Jets. their name is the Montreal and... Canadiens? Well, Liam, it gets even stupider. There's a Montreal Canadiens and a Vancouver Canucks. <laughs> Canadiens and Canucks are the same thing. What are they doing? So, I don't know. But, yeah, so the Montreal Canadiens just swept the, the Winnipeg Jets to win the North Division. In the NHL playoffs, so they are moving on. Is the North the Division way better? No, the North Division is way worse. Oh no, the Canadian teams are usually terrible. What are you doing, Canada? <laughs> you would think it, it does make logical sense, but the, the fact of the matter is, these Canadian teams are run by idiots for some reason. So I, I don't Jeez. know. Like the only the only good one was supposed to be Toronto, the, the Maple Leafs, mm. and they got out to a three one lead on Montreal and then blew it. So. Is that why, like, the yeah. hockey fans go so hard in Canada when they win? I, I, I think they just, they just really like hockey. No, oh, that's but right. They, they really like hockey, and all their teams are terrible for some reason. So when they so, win, they're like, we got to go. I guess so. I don't know. It's like they're, 
it's like it's I don't know what the Australian national sport was, but is but like it is Aussie oh, rules football. Okay, so imagine you had an Aussie rules football league with like Japan, and mm. Japan does, barely cares about it, but they they win it every single year, <laughs> and your team always lose. Because like the last the last time a Canadian hockey team won the Stanley Cup, Liam, it was the Canadiens. It was in 1993. Jesus, <laughs> it was the last time. And I don't even think they've been in a final, in a Stanley Cup final since 2011 now. Mm. I'm forgetting something. That was the, when the Canucks lost Is it like a, the a budget the thing or something? Like, why are they no, not being they, able to... It's, it's, I Liam, they just, they're all run by stupid people. I don't mm. know what else to say. And the, the teams that are supposed to be good, they always choke. So, like, the Canucks should not have lost that seven-game series to the Brewers. They were the best team in hockey. Mm. And they were like, what if we did, though? <laughs> <laughs> And then the the answer was the city burned down. Yeah, uh, <laughs> like riot, riots like across Vancouver. So there you go. I'm glad you're getting some hockey history lessons. Oh, here, I've, I've gone from a knowledge base of zero <laughs> to zero point five. There you go. You know Canada is. You know it's very popular there, and they're very bad at it for some reason. <laughs> so, uh, but yes. Yeah, so the starting battle main, which I thought was funny, they called it that the Gambari for wrestling offer match. Uh, it was Shu- uh, Shuichiro Katsumura, Koki Iwazaki, and Yumihito Imanari defeating Ken Oga, Keisuke Ishii, and Shota when Iwazaki pinned Shota the vertical drop reverse DT at 843. First of all, I'm pretty sure the lady doing the Gambari ring introductions was trying to rip off the old school Pride English announce lady with like this over the top yes. yelling. That was really fun. And killed it. Should have done the whole show. <laughs> it was really funny. Uh, sadly, we didn't get the whole bad communication entrance from Oka. The heel, I put question mark, because I don't watch Gambari. Right? The heel team jumped all of Oka's part, both of Oka's partners before Oka got in the ring, because I cut that off. Uh, Iwazaki ends up pinning Shota after surviving like a flurry for him. I thought this was a really good six-man showcase for, for Gambari. Right? They got some uh, pretty great action here. I went three and a half stars. I thought it was the highlight of the dark matches for sure. Uh, and, you know, despite the fact that his team lost, we did get a big back communication dance to the end with everybody, yeah. including some folks who weren't even in the match, like you never know, say. So, I um, I really like this. Uh, I don't again. I don't watch Gambit Pro uh, very much at all. I have watched a couple things, but um, I watched like a couple Corrigans over the years. Yeah, but these are the six people that I recognize from Gambit Pro, yeah. which really helped. So I was like, all right, I know well, Ishii, I, Oka, it's Shota. It's weird to me that like they put Ishii who like was awesome in DDT, and Iwasaki, who was awesome in DNA, and they're like, you know what you guys should go? Gumbari. I think it must just be, like, their pals with the Gumbari guys, right? And they just want to hang out with their friends. I guess so, maybe. But I'm like... It was very bizarre. Iwasaki, like, I love... I I love... It was like, I think that dude is awesome, and I wish he was on DDT main shows more often. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I just thought it was, like, Imanari is great. Um... Katsumura is the one I know the least about, but I have seen a couple of matches now. Um, all of them, I was really happy with the selection of people because they're probably the six people I recognize. Um, so I could actually get into it. A lot of fun. I like Oka. Uh, I'm glad they got some representation on this show. Yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, there you go. I'm looking, looking at scenes of the streets of Montreal, and they're all out there celebrating and <laughs> setting off fireworks. Very Hopefully happy it's just fireworks. <laughs> Uh, dark match number two mm-hmm. was the pre-show delayed entry battle royal. I don't. I mean, this show's been going long enough. I'm not gonna read everybody in here. Here's you guys know about this battle royal. I was Funky disgusted Crusty, by this. The man. entire trio was was uh, allowed to enter at the same time for some reason. Yep. Uh, I don't know. This was this really. I thought this was really nothing battle royal. Like usually these DT battle royals are really funny, and there was like. I guess the, the big comedy spot was here because one shot knockout uh, having no effect on Hino, but he did finally have a very delayed effect after 5,000 of them. But uh, the Saito one had no effect, and he thought it did for some reason. He turned around and started dancing, and Saito let him get through his entire dance routine while just standing behind him with his arms crossed. That was pretty funny. Uh, and then he just turns around and immediately pins him with this his signature Enzigiri. But, you know, that was the one really funny spot, but the rest of the match was not really funny or interesting at all. So, you know, uh, who won? I don't remember. Let's say it was, uh, um, it was won Honda. by Antonio Honda. Good for him. He pinned Masao in a way. 
I it was 22 minutes too, way too long. Was disgusted by this match, John. Yeah. There is one thing I wanted. I wanted Funky Express to go out there and dance with Harada. And they yeah. didn't do it. They immediately yeah. betrayed music. I am beginning to think Funky Express doesn't truly respect the music, doesn't represent it. I think <laughs> I think these guys are just doing a gimmick. I don't think they actually love music. That's what I came out of this from. I was disappointed by that. Mm-hmm. I was disappointed that Hino was stuck in this match and not in a cool match on the main card. I was mad about Saki Sama not being on this show at this point. I was going through a lot of emotions during this match, which made me didn't which made me not like it. So there you go. Uh, the, the very first match, the first starting battle kickoff, uh, was a Tokyo Joshi Pro Ten Woman Tag: Raima Umi, Suzume, Haru Neko, Moki uh, Moka Miyamoto, and Arisu Endo. They defeated Nao Kakuda, Raku, Palm Harajuku, Mahiro Kiryu, and the mysterious at debuting Kaya Toribami. Uh, under a mask, I've seen some people speculate she might be someone with experience or something because. She seemed pretty good here for her first match. Uh, but yes, Mayumi pinned Kiryu with the Lariat in 1229. Um, you know, they, this was cool. She like uh, Kaya did a nice little flip senton off the second rope at one point. Uh, Raku did a very nice sling blade. And there was a really cool exchange with uh, Barai and Mahiro at one point, uh, possibly the two best wrestlers in this match, so it made sense. But it featured a very hard Lariat from Barai at one point in the corner. Um, but, you know, and then she did like a, uh, like a rolling counter into a Kimura, another point, which was really cool. But Mahiro's partner ended up making the save for her. And the Mariah ends up finishing her off with a, another Lariat soon after. So perfectly fun little opener here. I went three stars on it. Um, I, I didn't know anyone. Um, <laughs> I, I, the only thing that I wrote down is that I thought the B girl had a lot of fire. <laughs> the B girl. There's a girl who was wearing uh, yellow and black and had like white trim, and I thought she had a lot of fire in this match, and that's all I could really say because I couldn't, I like, I didn't even know that I, I couldn't even put the names to the faces for this one. I was trying, but I was like, everyone seemed good, <laughs> like it didn't seem sloppy or anything, so I was like into it. But yeah, I, that's yeah. all I, all I could say was like the team, the 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 B star, like they seem cool. <laughs> Yeah. So that is your uh, Cyber Fight Festival. I thought it was a, you know, I, I don't know. I guess it was a great show. I mean, it's you know, it's show. really hard to say. It's a really long show, and everything up till match eight, you know, was like fine to good. So you know, a lot of stuff there. I mean, that's really eleven matches where there's a lot of wrestling to watch that with nothing being like truly great or awesome. But all the stuff that I expected to deliver, delivered. So, you know, everything after that was great, great stuff. So, overall, I can't really think of this as a great show. Yeah. If this had... If this match... Start, if this, sorry. If this show started with the the Young Guys tag, then into the, the Dino tag, into the top five, I think this would have been a slam dunk show of the year. But there was just a lot of filler on it, which made me... Which like the highs of the highs were really high, but like I can't call this one of the best shows of the year if I'm really bored throughout half well, of it. Twenty, I was gonna say twenty twenty one. I can. Well, yeah. To be fair, maybe in twenty twenty one, I'd have to go. <laughs> like, back I, don't, I, would, I I think it probably is my show of the year, my best major show because like I don't know, I can't really think of it. Maybe one of the Wrestle Kingdom nights or something. But yeah, I, I think really there hasn't been there hasn't been a lot. But it also helps that those Wrestle Kingdom nights were like only three hours. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I think even even most AEW fans would tell you. Well, I, okay, I can't speak on their second favorite. I didn't watch uh, Double or Nothing, but it didn't seem like that was blowing people away either. I'd probably put people Double or Nothing me... above this just on atmosphere because, like, that just okay. felt like right. wrestling was back. Like, I felt like a a stalwart moment. You know what I mean? More so than the show itself. Yeah. Basically, all I heard was the crowd was great. The show was, you know, not great. Is what I heard about to be that fair, one. that I show was it. fine. Like it was, it was actually pretty good. There was just a couple of reels. Like it's kind of like this show where there was some stuff in the middle that was real meh, but the rest of it, the peaks were high. Okay, so maybe that's a contender. But re- if anyone tries to tell me revolution wise, I'm going to tell them no, it's not because I watched that show and that <laughs> show fucking sucked. So uh, revolution, my thing. <laughs> not a good, sh- not a good show. 
Uh, but yes. Um, obviously, G Pro Wrestling anyway. version zero. Okay. So that is the Cyber Fight Festival. Great. So show. up next for DDT, the King of DDT 2021 mm-hmm. first round, which is coming up on Thursday, June 10th this week. So again, uh, we will be covering it on the Patreon at patreon.com slash wrestling omakase. Uh, we have an undermatch, which was the blowaway King of DDT 2021. Uh, Don Shokudino, Antonio Honda, Toro Washi, Kazuki Hirata, and Gota Ihashi versus Yusuke Okada, Yuki Ino, Yuki Onaya, Hideki Okatani, and Yuya Koroku. Uh, so kind of like the young guys against the comedy veterans. Uh, they are a, a slightly reduced field this year. It's only 16 guys, or usually they have these giant 32 and even 64 man fields. So maybe that's because of COVID. I don't know. But even last year during COVID, they, did, they had a bigger field. But the first round here is on the 16th. It's on the, the 10th, I mean, as I mentioned. Uh, the first round matches are Hiroshima versus Makoto Oishi, Yuji Hino versus Yuki Osagaguchi. That could be really good. Uh, Mao versus Soma Takao. That will be really good. Uh, or actually, no. Maybe, <laughs> well, that probably will be really good. I was going to say, you uh, said that, I and I had a physical reaction to it that, it, that couldn't come was, through you audio. Know what I was For some reason, I was like thinking it's Mao versus Yuki Ino. Okay. No, it's actually Mao versus Soma Takao. And was... Soma is very hit or miss. But Soma can hit when he hits. Yeah. I was I mean, just Soma like, when hit. you said, like, oh, that'll be great. I was will like, be. Yeah. Yeah. I was, for some reason, my head in my head, it was Mao versus Yuki. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, no, it's Mao versus Soma Takao, which could be good, I should say. Uh, Akito versus Kanosuke Takashita. That could be good also. Yuki Ueno versus Daisuke Sasaki. That will be good. I feel confident in that one. Uh, Shuma Katsumata versus Jun Akiyama. If Jun wins this, by the way, he gets to name his own challenger for the big outdoor Peter Pan show in Kawasaki. And Katsumata Higuchi versus Naomi Yoshimura. And finally, Tetsuya Endo versus Chris Brooks. So those that's our first round matches. Um, uh, the second round... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, if Akiyama wins, he said he was going to choose Takagi. Oh, that's right. He did say he picked Shinjiro Takagi. Well, that'd be something. Uh, the and we, and we there's a precedent now for this because obviously, uh, you know, Endo won and was going <laughs> to got that him, match, didn't but, he? <laughs> yeah, but they end up being Sasaki as the backup. So there you go. The second round is June twentieth at Korokin, and I think the finals is July fourth. I want to say it's definitely uh, USA. USA. So. USA. <laughs> but yeah, both like, both those are at Korokin. And also the Tokyo Joshi Pro Princess Cup is coming up soon. So those those that will cover that tournament for sure on the Omakase Patreon slash Omakase podcast. So definitely stay tuned for that. Okay. So uh, let's get ready to wrap things up here. I guess you can also mention too, uh, Tokyo Joshi has a Korokin on June 17th, which is uh, has a Princess Tag Team title match on top with Saki Sama and Mei St. Michael against Miyu Yamashita and Maki Ito. I'm very excited for that one. May St. Michelle. Whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Miyu Yamashita and Maki Ito. That, could, that should be awesome. Mm. And an international princess title match with Kari Noah against Marika Kobashi. I'm really excited for that. So that should be a lot of fun. Uh, then we have Yuka Sakazaki and Mizuki, the Magical Sugar Rabbits, against Rika Tatsumi and Hyper Misao. Uh, Marai Mayumi against Yuki Arai, her first singles match uh, for Yuki Arai. Uh, Yuki Kamafuku and now Kakuda against Miyu Watanabe and Mahi Okiryu. Uh, Shoko Nakajima against Kaya Toribani. And Nodoki uh, Tenma, Yuki Aino, Raku, and Palm Harajuku. It's a lot of words, everybody, today. Uh, against Suzume, Haruna Neko, Moka Miyamoto, and Ariso Endo. All righty. So that's coming up on June 17th. That card looks great. Very excited for some Tokyo and Joshi. That's a week from Thursday, a week, the week after the uh, candy T show. No, uh, no applause. Yeah. Come on. Uh, what's what? I don't even know what's going on. Um, I, I only remember one match. Like that's pretty big <laughs> coming up. They're doing uh, Nakajima and Kitamiya in the cage, hair versus hair. Oh yeah, that's true. Is it for both titles? Um, I don't know what they're doing with the titles. They have. Yeah, okay. Because neither one, neither one wants to give it up. So. That's coming up on June 26th at a, oh, it just says, pre- oh, that's a, that's an empty arena match. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. So that, that, I think that'll be pretty cool. Um, it's yeah. something very, like, it, it, my whole thing with Noah is that it's very stale, obviously. So the fact that they're doing some crazy shit, like a cage, I'm very into, so. Yeah. So there you go. The next Horkin show is June 30th and nothing on the card so far. But, uh, 
There you go. Good start. So, good start. So that'll do it, Liam. Anything you want to plug here before we wrap things up? Oh, uh, well, if only I had a podcast. It's like the longest episode in a long time. <laughs> yeah, well, wow. It was two big <laughs> shows, to be fair. That's true. That is true. Um, you can, I guess you can follow me on the Twitter if you want. It's the Great Muda, spelt the Great Muda, because I'm very funny. Um, yeah. You can read my uh, Great Glate uh, article on VOW that I wrote that got some good reactions to it. Um, and you can go follow the, the War Games pod account, I guess, in case something happens. Ooh. Well, what would happen? They're not on the same night anymore. Mm. Well, what could happen indeed? <laughs> but something okay. could happen. Okay. Liam with a tease. Mm. Okay. So, folks, you can follow us on Twitter, of course, at Russell Omakase, Wrestling One Fit, uh, the Omakase Patreon coming up this week. Thursday, we have the uh, King of DUT first round review, exclusively for patrons. And next week's Patreon exclusive show will be the New Japan Dominion Retro Roulette. Uh, myself, my buddy Quentin, are picking six random matches from Dominions of years past. I already picked up the matches. It's quite the bunch. So very excited to talk about those. So that's exclusively on the Patreon. If you want to listen, you got to sign up for $5 at patreon.com slash wrestling omakase. If you don't sign up, then I'll see you in two weeks for our next free episode, uh, which will be on something. I haven't really figured out yet what we're going to do in the next one. Maybe the, uh, um, for sure, the DT uh, second round, I think. And then maybe also that Tokyo Joshi show I just mentioned. Maybe we'll do that. Maybe that makes sense. I don't know if I want to do anything on Casino Road or not. Who knows? Probably not, because who cares about Casino Road? And I just wait to see what the cards look like, though, just to be safe. So, <laughs> they announced some real uh, crazy stuff on that card. You'll be, you'll be regretting <laughs> that, won't you? Yeah, well, that's why I'm not going to commit to that yet, but we'll see. Definitely DDT and Tokyo Joshi, and then we'll see if we want to cover any of those Casino Road stuff, too. Uh, but that'll be it coming up here on the free feed in two weeks. So. I was going to say, you're going to pop in a great uh, UWF show, I assume, coming up next week. Yeah. Very, very in touch with that, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, thank you, as always, for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show, and I will see you next time. Look around you, that car you're driving, that house your family lives in, making your daughter laugh, inspiring her to dream. You did that. Teaching your son to drive, teaching him he can be anything, all you, and your dreams for tomorrow. You'll do that too. Legacies don't just happen, they are made by you. The important word being you. American Family Insurance, protecting your dreams as you achieve them. Insure carefully, dream fearlessly. Products not available in every state. American Family Mutual Insurance Company, S.I. and its operating companies. American Family Life Insurance Company, 6000 American Parkway, Madison, Wisconsin. You didn't. Uh, yep. I thought you learned your lesson. I guess not. Dad, the vultures are back. Okay, kids, you know the drill. Windows up. Gone too far looking for a good deal on gas? Try Price Match, only from BP Me Rewards at participating BP and Amico stations. Learn more at bp.com slash best price. 